I didn't know when I met with Marlon Mark James and Katie Wilde that I was meeting with new adventurers. What I thought was a simple discussion on the topic of truck driving turned into a rabbit hole. Everything from AI to suicide and mental health, the structure of society and the role of automated transport will play in the future. But that wasn't everything. How to start your own podcast. Dreams are what matters most in life. The value of humans. And of course, I get carried away and get on my soapbox. But it was also the noisiest podcast to date, with running water heard in the background, static of some kind on my microphone, and the sound of my children stomping above our heads. Such are the woes of home-based podcasts. Subscribe to the channel, please, and hit the notifications bell, so you're notified every time a show is uploaded. The podcast is totally free to watch and listen to, and it's my hope that, as always, there'll be something to uplift everyone and help you in your life. That's me done. Let's roll the tape. Yeah, beautiful. Five, four, three, two, one. Marlon. That's me. Why the hell are you here? You invited me here. <laughs> I know. You're under your suggestion. <laughs> Yeah, well, I was... Well, it was a while ago. <laughs> I was... I asked you several times. The first time I met you was completely by accident. I just, yeah, yeah, I just came right. here doing a, a job, doing my day job, moving furniture and stuff. And and, it, and then I knew you were an awesome person from the moment of meeting you, so <laughs> I had to find you. Let on. him come on more often. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this already. I had to find you in the Facebook, and I actually found you via YouTube, not Facebook. All oh, right. That's right, because you told me you had a YouTube channel. I was like, ooh, I better have a look for that. You know, I actually found YouTube channels that I were defunct. And I've found material on the YouTube channels to where I was, when, you know, like when it first came out. Yeah, like, like literally I can't remember the passwords to even edit any of the stuff on there. Oh, you mean your older Old, YouTube channels? My older ego. Yeah, because I've done that too. I've got uh, gravestone type web uh, right. creations, which I can't. Now and can no longer log into or, right, yeah. or change or edit or any way. I mean, I still have a, a damn My, <laughs> MySpace account. Yeah, I think I probably do too. Yeah, and it's right, there's pictures of old pictures of me supposedly looking smooth, and uh, I can do that. Now, one thing we should do is off camera, Marlon has brought. Um, I'm sure she came on her own accord. I, I didn't drag her in. <laughs> no, but off camera, there's a <clears throat> very smart looking woman that you so happen to have accompanying you called Katie. And although she's off camera, I'd just like to acknowledge her being here. So introduce yourself, Katie. Hello, I'm Katie Wilde, and thank you very much for inviting me here. Please feel free to chirp in any time you like. Uh, maybe one day when this uh, studio has another two cameras, <clears throat> we will invite you on again, and I'll have another purple chair. Another one, another or a larger chair. one. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll have an interchangeable purple. Well, I do actually have an interchangeable purple chair just there, but the wrong purple. Oh, the wrong purple. Mm, wrong purple. So <laughs> now you're seeing, ladies and gentlemen, all the uh, faults that uh, I am going to change over the years. So <clears throat> thank you and welcome both to you to uh, sunny Belmont. Mm. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself, the journey of being Marlon, Marlon Mark James. Oh, the... Um, I I think I need to just acknowledge mine and Katie's togetherness as a team, and that's why she's here along here with me. Been together for a few months now, and everything's just our, our most recent changes in life are really amazing. We've really stepped our game up, and um, just last weekend got a really ridiculously awesome house bus. A house so, bus. <laughs> we are. <coughs> Um, a house bus. I mean, you know, when, when I think of a house bus, I mean, there was this, there was this old movie called um, The Big Bus, and it was about a nuclear-powered bus. <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. But um, whenever I think of a house bus, I think of this thing it has a swimming pool, a piano. <laughs> so t tell me about this. Uh, why and why today? Why 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 get a house bus? Well, um, I have already had this little motorhome made out of a 1983 Bedford uh, 
van basically but it was it was an ambulance back in the, the, the service years so it looks like an ambulance somebody painted it matte black before i bought it um it's been kitted out with a bed and bench tops and the sink and stuff in the back and but it's little and so um having katie come into my life and come and enjoy the freedom camping lifestyle that i've been doing for a few years now um just basically the situation is well she's got a few kids four of them and really <laughs> i do indeed it's like well four children yeah so if we all want to go camping together like a big family we need a, a bigger camper unit and, and look, i don't right. know, listen i mean look everybody knows i've got four girls right so it, <laughs> katie tell me about your children just now we're on this subject and i had no idea so you, you, what you've had fatherhood kind of boom, thrust onto you so oh to speak. yeah well i don't have any offspring myself but um i love that offspring i, love that I, I like that word yeah <laughs> yeah offspring. but uh um pretty good at the at being good with children and everything and there's always been young people in my life mm -hmm. um my young youngest brother is 20 years younger than me right um, <clears throat> well yeah so that makes him five <laughs> good one good one uh, <coughs> so yeah so hey, what's your what's the sexes what's your i didn't quite end up with my quartet of girls like you have my last one was a boy so all right three girls one boy three girls and one boy wow yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Um, a little later than when they were produced. <laughs> well, so, so you've had, so you both had some interesting kind of um, surprises thrust on you, so to speak. Oh, yeah, all my life. You just. We've both <laughs> had very interesting lives. For sure. yeah. Cool. So we need to discover all of these. Mm. So. We were on the house bus. Let's have a look at uh, what you were doing. And what, and what, and I do oh. need to say he did ask about putting a piano on the house bus, which I had to say no to. That's a dumb <laughs> idea anyway, because <laughs> pianos go out of tune when they travel. Eh? Oh, yeah. well, I think they can get a bit knocked around you, a bit. You, you can get a keyboard? Yes, oh, I've got a piano. I actually have one. Wait a minute, you want a real piano? <laughs> well, if you don't have a piano, you have a piano, not a keyboard. I've got this old Roland. Yeah. Um, uh, you know keyboard synthesizer and it looks like the starship enterprise it's right. it was made in the 90s and it's got all these buttons buttons yeah, galore yeah, yeah. Cool. and this little digital screen with like two Wait, lines of text it's not the roland uh, jx8p is it no i think it was or the a, super jx e86 all right e86 <clears throat> but yeah anyway um i mean i inherited that from my grandfather when he died and then I learned, lend it to my sister because she's got four kids and they all can have a bang away on it just like we did when we were kids. Uh, so it's, it's just doing the rounds around the family. I still feel like it's mine, but not really. It's just everybody's. Uh, yeah, I had it um, immediately after my grandfather passed away, which was nice to get that. And I got his awesome little guitar um, and another guitar, which was a 1964 Hoffner. Wow. Um, that actually got stolen in a burglary. So I'm gutted that that's not in my life anymore. It was so cool. I wanted to restore it. Yeah. So here we are. We have your, your, your travelling now. So when did you get the bus? Last weekend. Last weekend. So we're four days, five days in. Just speak in the microphone, just. To... Sorry, yeah, that's all right, mate. I'm just checking with Katie. Yeah, no, over that's here. Right. She'll, you'll chime in, you chime in, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> so we got it on Saturday, and today is Thursday. Is it? No, it's Wednesday. Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting a day ahead of myself. I'm wishful thinking it was Thursday, getting closer to the weekend. <laughs> so what do you, what do you plan to do? What's this idea? I mean, of course, you know, you were saying, you know. Katie and four kids, mm. four children, four offspring. Um, what's why the bus? Why not settle in a home or anything else like that? What's what's the what's the, what's the? So the, there was an objective um, to go find a house, mm. but uh, we just were finding that they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars mm. and up towards the millions of dollar ranges. It was quite fun though, going mm. and looking at open homes and going, oh, this house is cool, imagine living here, and like, I'd love it, <laughs> and all of that buzz. Years. But yeah, and mm. there's Katie, the other reasons. Um, the, then, the, but I, I've already been not living in a house for a long time. Like, How uh, many years? Uh, Four? Four years. Um, well, yes, four, we're at year four now. And this is because I was doing long-haul truck driving all over the island. 
living in company paid motels and then I, th- I was renting a flat at first and I thought why do I have these bills when I'm never here to right. use and enjoy this flat right. so instead I just went to the bank and got a loan and I thought I'll just pay a loan which is about the same amount as the re- weekly rent would be right. and um, and buy a camper van and just, if you ask me, coming from where I am, I mean, that sounds like a really sensible idea. Well, for me, just solo old me, old me, and no kids, no responsibilities, you know. Um, so, you know, I had a few girlfriends over the years, and sometimes we go stay at their place. Don't listen to this at all. Uh, <laughs> still have the trees. Yeah, and um, mm. you know, so I would spend time in houses, but I always had my camper right. for my own self time to go get away or just to be where I wanted to be at times um, and also I would hardly use it be just the same as I would hardly use a flat if I had been renting one because I was always on the road on the trucks um, living in motels uh, all around the North Island. So really if I was to describe you initially it would be a man of wheels. Yeah, I remember uh, this old boss. Because I kind of met you on wheels, so he, to speak. He didn't called I? me. My old boss called me a wheel once. He he said, Marlon, you're a you're a sage and a scholar and a wheel." And I thought, when you put those three together, I was like, "Well, I sort of know what a sage is and a scholar." And I, but what what does it mean if someone describes you as a wheel? And I've never really figured that one out. I guess it keeps moving. <laughs> yeah, well, I was a wheel man for that man when I worked for him. That was years ago. I worked uh, uh, for a poster company. Um, you know the fat and bill stickers. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, and uh, you know, just drive around with a van full of shelf shelves full of posters. You may have done my poster full of for glue. 2008. Oh yeah, well, it's about then that I was working for them. I think or the I was all over Wellington yeah. with my stage name, so you might have done me. Well, I worked uh, for the company in Auckland. All right. Um, and then when I quit, uh, they wouldn't let me stop working for them. So I wanted to leave Auckland, and I moved down to the Bay of Plenty. And they, they said, "Oh, you can work for us down there," and they created me a job to do down there. And then uh, I sort of got fired from that after getting sick. And not really reporting into work and <laughs> making some mistakes there, um, and then, but then still after that they had me come back and as a um, uh, running the the Hamilton operation. This was pretty much a one man show in right. Hamilton City, but um, they heard that I had moved to Hamilton. They're like, oh, well, this is perfect. You can. Um, our guy in Hamilton needs to go on a holiday, you know, he's got all this annual leave banked up and we need to get him out, you know, he wants to go to Fiji or something, so I did a little bit in Hamilton, but I never did the posters in Wellington. Now I'm down here driving around Wellington looking at all these beautiful Phantom Bill stickers poster sites and thinking, man, I would like to do it again, you know, I'd like to get back on those vans and go and smash up some more posters. <laughs> well, so, so you're a man of wheels and mm. I'm really interested... When somebody's picking their their bus, what do you look for? Not just size, but what are you looking for? Mm. All the mod cons, or yeah. Well, I know that the solar power is essential. Like um, having batteries on board, which can give you know power up your devices. I mean, I mean, we're not very power hungry people. There's a TV on this bus. We haven't even turned it on yet. Uh, <laughs> we'll get there eventually. Eh? We do like the Netflix um, yeah. from <laughs> time to time, um, but we would just watch that on a, on a laptop in my camper van before right. this, um, and chuck a pa- extension cable out and plug it in if if we were at a place with power. Or otherwise, just run on batteries. Um, but yeah, now it's gone in a bit more um, with, with the bigger bus. We got a bit more high tech going on and we've got gas for cooking, gas runs the fridge, gas powers the hot water. The shower in this bus is so good. It's so good for a house but for a camper shower. Like, really? Because yeah, some of them are like piss poor, like standing right. under a, a drip. Uh, but this is good. So this is, a, what year are we talking about? This bus is a, if you want to look it up people, it's the registration is uh, It's a personalised plate. It says 
right. which is short for fucking off, oh. because the added additional text on the plate says for the weekend. So it's for the, for the weekend. No, oh, cool. Well, that wasn't our idea. It just came on the bus. It just came on the bus. Oh, cool. But um, yeah, if you look it up on Car Jam, um, you can get the specs on the bus and what size the motor is and all that stuff. Because actually, I didn't even know, nor do I care much. Right. I know it's been repowered with a modernized Uzu motor. The body of the bus is a 1970 Bedford van right. or something like that. Yeah, very nice. And it, it's been done up beautifully. Right. Like, yeah. You know, you try to find things wrong. There's a little bit of few things wrong, probably hiding in there somewhere. But from the outside, it's just like, wow, beautiful bus. It's so good. And then you park my rusty old camper next to it. This thing's mostly made out of fiberglass because it used to be an ambulance. Right. <laughs> and it's been painted matte black. And it's, it's well, got, that's the one you got parked outside. Yeah, right? that's the one that's yeah. parked out there. Gosh, um, that's, a, that's a, I mean, it's a bit of a, an animal. I know. You know it's got a Chevy motor in it. It right. sounds like an animal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I heard they you all do. Up and I just thought, who the <laughs> hell is that? <laughs> I was hoping, like, not. I wasn't. I don't know what you were doing in here before I came, but I was hoping that it, you went recording or something. I was like, oh, because well, I'm no, rumbling was, in here with this not, Chevy. I was, I was teaching a guy to to, to sing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I felt the earth rumble. <laughs> That's, that's what it was like, you know. Well, the bus has has some go for it. It's a diesel, big truck diesel right. motor. Um, and it just goes... Right. Rah, 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 right, when you right. give it gas, you know, it's so good. And I'm a truck driver um, these days, so um, they're, they're all... They're, every vehicle has its different eccentricities and mm. different little things. You've got to learn the differences between them. And I drive quite a few different trucks, get moved from truck to truck to truck these days. Yeah, so that's that's a good segue to coming to Wellington. Right. Because I, I was doing that long haul driving mm. with a company based in Tauranga. <laughs> um, but then uh, within the first year of travelling around like that, I knew I wanted to move to Wellington, but then right. I, I just didn't do it until this year. I finally decided, right, it's actually time to do it. I've just been dreaming about it for three years, and now mm. it's time to do it. And What's Wellington's pull, do you think? <sighs> well, for me, um, I've always sort of loved the magic of the art scene in Wellington, definitely. Yeah. Um, and although not having really experienced much of it firsthand, but just hearing about it <laughs> and like knowing that it exists and then um you know i've done a i've been involved in performing arts for pretty much all of my life was that in, your in um, dribs and drabs like right. nothing Is, like was that your professional um, but the seed of of marlon james marlon mark james is that who you are the performer and that's why i went for the triple banger name because i right. thought it sounded cool as an actor <coughs> name, Hold on, i'll know. tell you what i'm just going to say it for you <laughs> Marlon Mark James. Uh, but I, I should say, I mean, I ought to do Katie Wilde's name, right? Oh, you know, do that. Katie Wilde. Mm. I like that. Do you know, if you had both of those names at the beginning of a movie, I mean, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be disappointed, would you? <laughs> Marlon Mark James. I said James. Marlon Mark James and Katie Wilde star in... Bus Wars. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> we, we, we bought a bus. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> now what? Oh. We have to drive it. Yeah. Oh. I don't drive it. Yeah. <laughs> so you, it's very funny, Katie, because you say that with quite, you know, well, I don't drive it, do I? <laughs> what do you think I am? <laughs> <laughs> Man, the gear shifter on this thing is actually... A bit, you know, like it's, you know, I drive these uh, these trucks for work, mm. and they have just got nice, smooth, yeah, like yeah, yeah. easy gearboxes. This thing's like a, uh, uh, so even if she could drive it, it's just gonna wear her out. It was wearing me out, and I've got these guns, man. <laughs> Well, I, I reckon Katie, yes, I was going to say, Katie's just shown me her Katie's arm. Like, yeah, that's right. And she said, watch out. <laughs> well, Katie, I'm sure you can pack more of a punch than I, I can. Matter of fact, <laughs> whenever I go on a date with a woman. Arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, if you can beat me. They I'll always, <laughs> yeah, well, I'll tell you what, they always comment on my feminine hands. Look at my hands, Marlon, look at them. Look at them. Come on. They are beautiful. Oh, thank you, Katie, but look at them. 
you, yeah, I know. How do you make how, them so smooth? How smooth, lovely. right? There was one woman I was <laughs> uh, not seeing, but just with, and uh, she she always came up to me and she said, "You must bathe in Nivea." <laughs> And, I, 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 and, the, and she always said, said that I smelt of Nivea. And I only... Uh, listen, I'm going to tell you, I'm such a cheapo. I really am. I smell like a million dollars. But really, it's a $10... And, you, and listen, if anybody sees this from the warehouse, it's a $10 perfume called Vigorous. Vigorous? And you can get it for five bucks now. Anyway, it smells just like, like a... Um, an old spicy kind of thing. I want to try it now. Yeah, you sold got, you got it to me. Okay. <laughs> there we go. With that chocolate. Oh, the, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. A, a, a voiceover. The chocolate uh, voice. Yeah. <laughs> Vigorous. The ladies will love you. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's so Katie can pick a punch. But you know, it's quite yeah. funny. You talk about these um, uh, manual uh, gears and stuff. You know, I mean, you know, the audience right now. I think a lot of them will go. What's that? I know, right? I know. And these days, it's an it's an anti theft deterrent because the thieves can't drive it. <laughs> I never thought of it like that. No, I'm going to tell you. You're people talking... go, oh no, I can't steal this. I can't even drive it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Mm. Well, I didn't even think about that. Maybe you ought to bring manual gears back every twenty five years. Mm. Mm. That's not going to happen, though. No, it's not. No. No. It's the, ro the robots are going to take over. Now, that's an interesting <laughs> thing. Because here you are, you're driving a truck, it's got <clears throat> um, uh, manual gears, it's diesel, and the robots are going to take over. What do you think about that whole scenario? You think about Elon Musk and his, you know, how about your job as a, as a driver? I mean, think... How you, does that worry you at all? Well, <clears throat> I thought about this at length. Well, Probably you know. the most important thing I can say is that this there's going to be a uh, if it's all going to go ahead, there's going to be like a weird interchanging mm -hmm. between the two options, like a transition where, where humans are driving alongside the robots. Mm. But I think that the ultimate goal would have to be to remove all human drivers from the system, every single one of them. Um, so my vision for the future is like, uh, well, first of all, all of the vehicles, the wheels or the flying machines or whatever will belong to the city or to everybody. Mm -hmm. That way there can be less of those than there are Travel pods is what I'm thinking of. Everyone will have a travel pod. People are going to love having their own travel vehicle, but it just needs to be a pod. And then the wheels come along and pick it up and take it where it needs to go and then drops it off. And the wheels can therefore do that for everybody. They can just move around the system, picking up a pod here and dropping it there. And Almost like a wi you order it by Wi-Fi kind of thing. Yeah, like you just get in your pod and go doot, 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 and then within five minutes some wheels turn up and pick you up and take you away. Not only that, but if the pod is designed to be carried by lots of different modes of transport, like if they're going to go on a high-speed network, that thing will do, that one set of wheels will drop you off and put you on another kind of thing that whisks you at a higher speed on a train with That's everybody else. That's a really else. original idea. And, um, and <coughs> the other thing is uh, the quad, the, co the helicopter things, you know how we're flying around our little drones with mm. cameras on and stuff these days? Well, on the bigger scale, that's the flying... That's the flying taxi. So you, you might live somewhere up in the hills in Wellington and instead of wheels coming to pick you up, who needs roads? Just have a thing come and take you, take you somewhere, take you to wherever that needs to take you to connect you up to whatever you, else you need to connect what do, to. So what do, what do you think about um, uh, the ownership idea, you know, like that everybody owns... Um, so, for instance, so the wheels belong to someone. I mean, is that is that the government run or is it a private organisation? It's a city infrastructure. It's a city thing. infrastructure. And then in different cities, there'll be different sets of wheels maintained by those cities. Um, and then there'll be intercity uh, ways to commute your travel pod. The main thing is they all work in 
harmonious unison to move your travel pod where you want it to go. Because mm. people, that's going to be the hardest thing for people to give up is the space. Their car is this, their space. It's like an office. They put all their shit in there. They, <laughs> like there's this uh, the other idea about autonomous taxi is. Um, is that everybody uses the same taxi mm. and so well, Uber it is a little bit yeah, like that like isn't a, it right a robot now. Uber but a robot Uber but yeah. then you've got to think about how all that sharing is like some of these people getting in and out of it who's cleaning it mm, right. <laughs> you know or does it auto clean itself between passengers somehow like that's an option but I don't like that because you, you just get in with your car go and get out with your car go you can't leave anything in your car right. but I think and I know because I've been driving hun, hun, I've driven hundreds of vehicles and I've owned a lot of, lot of vehicles over the years and I keep all my all these things in my car and I just want them in my car you know and that's just how I go and when I sell a car I pull all that stuff out and put it in my and new car and somebody else comes along and says well this is another place <laughs> Put my shit. <laughs> so I think people are going to always want that. So the personal travel pod thing for your family, for yourself, right. different pods for different modes, maybe like that's how people are going to carry on. You do realise that this is a groundbreaking podcast right now because you've just explained all of that. Probably, yeah. Because I mean, I it's future thinking. Yeah, it's future thinking, right? I mean, <laughs> I don't know if we'll enjoy it because it might be too far in the future. But well, I mean, um, Musk is obviously he's digging underground under the under LA. I think he's doing that, isn't he? He's digging underground. He's gone three three um, three stories down, mm. and so you have different levels. And so, I think what's going to happen, as far as he's uh, aware, please top up if you need to. Mm. Water. I've water, water okay. Yeah, you're cool. Yeah. Um, I think he's going to find, he's saying that there's there's too much traffic on on the, uh, on, the, the on the surface. Yeah. So he, he's basically taking each car down. And he says you can go down 15 floors. So you've got 15, 15 cars occupying the same uh, space, but on top of one another. Mm. And you just put your car there on the motorway. Uh, the car turns off and a bit like you with the travel pod idea but it's not so much a pod it's just a set of like railway wheels so to speak it then sends you at relatively high speed to the other end of that motorway mm. but there's 15 cars in that same area mm. rather than one and then you've got six abreast or or two abreast or whatever it is yeah but i think i think the pod idea um katie make some noise darling make some noise <laughs> The, the only reason I say the pod is yeah. because it's separate from the wheels. Yes, that's uh, right. Or whatever else is transporting it. It allows that pod to be moved in lots of different ways. And and there isn't... Like, the, one of the phenomenons of how we run everything now is that there's all these vehicles parked. If they're not in use, they're parked, and they're just... Mm. They go, you know? Mm. If there would be less wheels... Ta less machines taking up all of our space. Yeah. If we, well, not you know, it's just pointless them standing still. They're made to work, you know. Right. That's and right. and so they should be not. We, they shouldn't belong to us. They right. should only the tra the travel part of the vehicle should. So so is <laughs> the you know idea. these um, um what are they called um scooters that we have around the city they're darted all over the city mm. at the moment mm. and we pay a small fee and i don't actually don't know what the fee is i haven't actually been on one to be honest with you but um right now we have a bit of an issue you know they're thrown everywhere vandalism vandalism they get drowned they, yeah so yeah that's right um, that's so what's our the solution thing. there what's our solution I don't know. I think they're probably cheap enough to manufacture that they don't care when, when that they lose a few here and there. Right. And the other day, actually, I did a delivery, no, a pickup, but sort of the same thing. Turned up with my truck to one of the um, work warehouses where they maintain and repair them when they get a bit damaged. Right. So there's all these... It's like... <laughs> Like a, if it was a sci-fi movie, there'd be all these robots going, oh, there's something wrong with me, that's something, fix me, fix me, you know, right. like there's all these scooters in various disarray, right? stacked over here and stacked over there and one on the bench and guys are working on it and putting them together again and, yeah. Well, that would soon be automated too, wouldn't it? Possibly, because, yeah, well, 
we could go too far down the rabbit hole and start talking about bloody AI and the technological singularity and uh, well, wait a minute oh, and the, I don't think that's too far <laughs> no well uh, the lead expert so he says also a lot of people say this guy called Kurzweil reckons it's coming in the next within the next 20 years between 2030 and 2040 or mm. something like that I think he might have actually put an exact number on it like I just know it's going to be such a year but I can't remember exactly what year he said well it's quite funny I mean uh, uh, there's a lot of <laughs> conspiracy and then there's a lot of actual fact stuff um, mm. so you know I was talking to a, a chap just to, no last Tuesday and he said you know everybody got really worried about the fact that everybody was going to be micro tripped right because we all had a we all have a personal um, national insurance number, don't we? You know, a GST number or mm. a tax number. We all, we all have one of those. And um, we were going to be chipped. But we don't have to be. We've all got phones. Mm. So our, our phones are they are already a personalised number. Well, this is what I remember Kurzweil saying, because he, he talks a bit about the transhumanism. Call it, that's what they call it, when they're mm. putting the computers inside Science. our bodies. Yeah. Um, so he goes, we're pretty much already doing that, you know, like, we're putting it in our pocket for now, but eventually people are going to start wanting to put it inside themselves. And, and I think it's Elon Musk is, is building a computer that, that goes in your head, in your brain. That's right, the Neuralink. Yeah, the Neuralink. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm really, I, I'm both excited and freaked out by it. Mm. Because I, because my understanding of Neuralink is that it's there to assist those that have uh, limited lifestyle right now. So if uh, and I I'm you know I'm a moron. I don't understand any of this. But if I say okay, um, my I've had a severance maybe of some kind of a, not, maybe not the spinal cord, but maybe my nerves are damaged, and my body has to relearn to walk. Well, I imagine, and I've had something explained like this to me before, that this implant, because they've done one in a pig. Mm, mm. Yeah, they've done one in a pig. All right. Yeah, they've already done an experiment in a pig, and you can look Wh this up. Which it's leg did they eat? I mean, sorry, did they <laughs> yeah, lop off and, what, and test yes. the system with... Yeah. Vegan, <laughs> vegans, please, <laughs> lock your ears. <laughs> but yeah, so they, so they had this, um, so this thing where they... The testing it in the pig, but anyway, but, but the idea is, is that you could then create new neural pathways that then allow that leg to operate, but it, it isn't so much you because it's just mechanics, mm. essentially, and um, electro impulses and stuff like that, messages. Um, like I say, I speak out of my ass. I'm a moron, but that could take over the mechanics which don't function anymore naturally, um, and so I, I, I think that's commendable you know people have artificial limbs right mm. okay so we've now got these high-tech artificial limbs which make you run faster i mean they're literally 25 miles an hour yep. uh, in 25 miles an hour uh, it's just unbelievable i've seen this yep. 25 miles an hour those there's those legs which aren't they're just a prosthetic yeah. they're not a robot leg but they're just like a big boomerang shape they thing. are they're like a, they're like a hockey stick aren't they yeah <laughs> but uh, with a flat kind of thing they allow you to just move so quickly those i've seen those people running on those and that um the double the double ones work better than one and yeah, one normal leg right. yeah but <laughs> they go really fast they do and they worked out oh we just make them a bit bigger and they can go even faster <laughs> well that's right there's this guy who has uh uh he puts it on and it's almost it almost there goes my knee. So it, it's hooked here like this. And then there's another bit behind it, like a, like a massive tendon that oh, moves yeah. and that can do this, whereas your own tendon only has a certain amount yeah. of, of give or, or length on it. This artificial tendon is massive. So uh, what if we just get rid of cars completely and tell everyone, right, that's it. We're taking your legs and we're replacing <laughs> them with these and you guys can fucking, you could just run. <laughs> just right. run wherever you need to go. It's easy. Look at these. Look at this. But I mean, I don't see what, what would stop us from having a boot that was somewhat the same. Oh, yep. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Oh, have you? Yep. Yeah, I've seen it. And it's, um, they, they're kind of like pogo stick legs. Right. Um, and the guy that I saw demonstrating it could do backflips. 
He's like going bouncing, bounce, and could, and he could run too. And it's like boom, 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 you know, like this, massive this is strides do down some, the street. I'm going to do some post research on this, and and, and whilst mm. you're speaking, they're kind of like stilts, aren't they? They they strap to your whole bottom of the leg, and then there's this big thing that comes all the way out over there, you know, and it's got a big rubber foot on it, and and he's just this dude's juggling as well, jumping around on this thing, um, that fired. Juggling fire. You know, now you speak, <laughs> you know, we're speaking of post apocalyptic kind of stuff now. Huh? You know, look, so we've got. Um, it's, it sounds like a new world, doesn't it? It sounds like the new world of. Um, so our transport fails, our, our, our bodies fail. <laughs> you know, people want things even faster, the demand for speed. So now we've got our pods, we've got our artificial limbs. You, the truck driver, have just made. A whole new world. A whole new world. <laughs> I just want to go park in the bush and and hide away from everybody else. <laughs> but that is a pity. Have a isn't garden it? and yeah. some chickens and. Mm, not, can't really think of any other animals I would like. Yeah, well, they, I've got cats that shit everywhere, so. Mm. Chickens Dogs. do that too, but it's good for the garden. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not something I'd like to handle is catch you. I did for my mate the other night. I was house sitting her house and her cat, and this was last week now. And uh, yeah, um, when she had left her house, her cat had been accidentally trapped in the bathroom. So when I got back, I had found a cat that was trapped in the bathroom. And we find out everything on this with podcast. With a pile of poop. <laughs> And then I, at first, like, oh, this is cool, this is such a cool story. At first I was like, ooh, I closed the door because it smelled bad. And I went and sat in the lounge and I texted his mum to c complain, ah, oh, your cat's pooped in the bathroom. And then I sat there and I thought, well, I can't just leave it in there. <laughs> I'm going to do something about it. Okay, let me work up the motivation. And I just sat for a while and then eventually I was like, all right. It's time to go and clean up the poop. <laughs> Is that something that affects... I'm just thinking about that in terms of a life, you know, when there's some kind of unsatisfactory thing that we need to do and then we procrastinate and we don't do it. And it's it's an ugly smell in our lives, you know. It could be anything, you know. Um, the fact that we need to move on, the fact that we need to... Uh, find a new job or, or or start doing you know you know first of January the gym is going to be filled full of hopeful kind of summer bodies mm. and then by the end of January they've paid up their gym membership and they're back oh, at home oh this is about the new year's resolutions <laughs> I'm going to start going to the gym this year I'll start straight away that's the cat poop though does the smell well, it, have it's to be? Well, di it's different. If I, in the past when I've had my own pets, yeah. it was like, as soon as I found the poop, I'm like, damn it, and I'll just go straight away and deal to it, you know, <laughs> grab that poop. But this is my friend's <laughs> cat's poop. For that, and yeah. I'm like, ah. Oh. And I've considered, briefly, just leaving it there for her. It's her cat. She can clean it up. And I thought, that's mean. <laughs> like, I just I kicked my own ass about that. And I was like, no, I can't do that. And it's so ownership <laughs> is important. So you've got to own the shit. Yeah. And <laughs> own the shit. <laughs> um, that sounds like own the shit. Buy one, get one well, free. Well, I took own the shit oh, that you night. You took own the shit. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> Good on you. It used to be my job to clean up shit. Yeah. That's really? right. Yes. Why did you clean up shit? I used to work as an SPCA inspector, so... So were you cleaning up real shit and also implied shit like somebody Indeed. else? Indeed. Implied shit. All of it. All of it, real shit and implied shit. Indeed. What would be an implied bit of shit? <laughs> oh, you put me on the spot there. <laughs> um. <laughs> Some cat has been mistreated by the owner not cleaning up its shit. <laughs> anyway, yeah. I just wanted to say, um, just ch just I was just listening to Katie's beautiful voice there and thinking, don't you just love the sound of her voice? Don't you wish that you could see her? <laughs> That's why I'm off camera. I'm yeah. blushing so much. Are you blushing? 
can't, there's no reason why you can't sit on his lap. <laughs> Except for you might bump the microphone. Maybe. Bump. But we'll bring you in at the end of this and we'll, we'll, we'll show everybody <laughs> Ka- Katie and we'll... The beautiful Katie Wilde. Beautiful Katie. And I, you I, have to wait until the end of the podcast. Yeah, I could easily give up Listen. my seat, you know. Nobody actually <laughs> wants to see me. Um, but Katie came as a bit of a surprise tonight, so um, I will be prepared next time and have two, and I'll have two other cameras. You see, because when I first met you, mm. I had, was uh, I just got inspired about like, I want a setup like you've got here. I want to get into podcasting, and I wonder if Charles would let me use his studio and and make some podcasts. I was having all these fantasies. Um, about even moving in. <laughs> I thought, you wanted to move in with me? Well, I, well, I, I don't currently it. have a girlfriend, so um, but <laughs> the other side of my bed. He does. <laughs> I've yes, got a sorry. bed on wheels, mate. Oh, that's true. Back then, I was going to say something. I thought say about so. it, I wanted to park, because it's a perfect bloody park right <laughs> next to your house, except it would annoy your neighbours having to look at the ugly van all day. <laughs> Um, <laughs> this is this is new to me. I mean, this is kind of like a liberty, <laughs> but at, the, at least it was in fantasy. Yeah, well, yeah. But I mean, Marlon, I mean, there's no reason why you can't do a podcast, and you don't need a setup. I, I just did um, a podcast with a great a guy called, and I'm gonna, just going to plug him because he's so mm. brilliant. Uh, called the Butters Podcast. Yeah, well, I watched it. Oh, did you? Well, did you? Listen to listen it. to it, right? Yeah. Well, the Butters what? Podcast. Uh, he he travels around with this great sophisticated little microphone this big mm. and that's what recorded it okay in this studio who used that mic um but he's uh, I, I really like uh, james james is really on the money with his questions his interest mm. and that thing and I, um, I, I learned a great deal just doing it with him it was really great. And, and that's one of the reasons why i haven't got the alcohol this evening for me <laughs> because i'm a lightweight <laughs> I got all melancholy <laughs> and cried a couple of times. Oh, mm. But yeah, so mm. Marlon, I think you're quite unique in the fact that I think your bus makes you unique. Yeah, uh, but well, there's other people like doing the same thing. So. Well, no, no, I just think that... But I'm definitely u- unique. I'm the only me. Well, yeah, hey, <laughs> do you know what? I said to somebody very recently... Um. And in actual fact, I wrote this as well for an upcoming, up, upcoming, <laughs> upcoming uh, life lesson um, episode. Um, and it was that nobody lives your life better than you do. <laughs> and no one can live it for you. Mm. And so when you hear people who criticize or make comments about the way people live or their lifestyles or anything else it's always from the fact that nobody else is living that life it's only you so uniquely marlon is living a life that is uniquely marlon Mm -hmm. and it isn't and, and i think when we look at one another as uniquely human uniquely i'm going to say it again uniquely marlon uniquely katie you see then there's always an interest from the perspective of that individual that no one else has. No one else has that perspective. Um, And that's why when you say, oh, look, there's plenty of people doing that thing. I think you, the bus, you can set up your bus as a studio. Oh, that's the that's the dream, yeah. You know? And and I desire for like, because Katie wants to. Well, I sort of have a vision for Katie working from home. Wherever the bus is, um, have Katie, do you <laughs> share that vision? I do indeed. Yeah, good. So the, the and then I, um, her being like interested in health and well-being and, mm. and coaching people, their diets and things like that. Uh, she could probably tell you about it better than I can. But you I just have to have your own moment. Uh, <laughs> Maybe we could do it in a few weeks' time. We could have you talk about that, and we'll put you in that chair. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I'll and I'll try and shut up in, in the background because <laughs> I talk too much. You know. But yes, yeah, so you're saying so. Katie's very much interested in. I in, in, I want to set her up a, a awesome as computer in there, so we're we'll w- making steps in that direction, um, just to manage that. Mm-hmm. Uh, being able to connect with people mm. um, with the video calling, but I want, you know. Um, doesn't really matter what the clients do at the other end um, as long as they've got a connection but I want Katie's 
broadcast to be awesome you know for everyone that she gets she deals with to see like beautiful katie and her lovely house bus and have like an awesome camera angles and a good lighting and um and for her to be able to see them big and clear on a big screen right. during during the context you know so so i've got i've got two podcasts i'd like you to look at um, one is called valuetainment 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 <laughs> And he interviews his, interviews his, he interviews loads of individuals from all, he's interviewed um, gangsters, like people mm. from the mafia. He interviews people who are politicians. He interviews people who are. That would be cool. I'd like to do an interview show myself. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the reasons I, I do this is because I'm a moron <laughs> and I don't know enough. And so, you know, you, you come here, Katie comes here. And so I'm learning now that there's a lifestyle in actual fact. I'm thinking about it. And in actual fact, I'm now, and I, I, I may not be on a bus, but what I really like is the dream. Yeah. I really like the idea that, okay, that's a dream outside of my dream. I don't share that dream, but it's a great dream. Yeah. And I like the idea. And you've just depicted Katie with her beautiful screen, seeing, seeing her... Um, the, you know, the interviews she has about life and wellness and whatever else interests you. I'm sure that's not limited there. And, you know, cat shit clean up. Um, <laughs> Owner shit. And implied shit. shit. I love <laughs> Cat shit clean up with Katie Wilde. It's wild shit. And she's Katie. But if people just ring you up to go, oh, look, the cat did another poop. And you have to coach them to clean up the poop. <laughs> yeah. You can do it. <laughs> you can do it. You can. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, um, here's the thing, you know, you got you got you got your kind of funky you. You got your beautiful hair. Oh, just bang the mic. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I'm bomb. <laughs> your, your funky hair. You there. You got this really good look. I think you'd be really good as that front individual, interviewing people who really have extraordinary lifestyles. Mm. I mean, I I like doing this because, like I said, I'm a moron and I like to learn stuff. So, uh, yeah, I've, I was I shared this dream with Katie. I wanted to set up my camper um, as a because that's more versatile. It can squeeze into tighter gaps than our big bus, right? right but I yeah. wanted to set that up as like a a street side podcast creating machine, so that you know we set it up at in the streets and wherever, you yeah. Know? parts of Wellington, maybe around the country, mm. maybe tour the country. But um it, yeah, have it be like the 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 unit that's powering all of the right. technology. Yeah. But I want I want camera angles, I want lights, I want it all to be running on solar power and and high tech, you know, ideas and then being able to uh not necessarily edit but uh but, you know, make sure it's really good quality product with the hardware well i mean whether or not you, you and like... interviewing people in the streets was why I did. yeah yeah like, well, interview, I think just it... come and sit with me that's right let's talk have, like have just you seen... talk to anybody like yeah. in the streets have you seen louder with crowder yes right okay so louder and crowder is the very thing that i imagine you would do yeah uh, not typically subject matters that he does but louder because i imagine you'd probably be slightly less vicious but uh um, I imagine you doing that really well, and I think people would would really enjoy you doing that. One concept I came up with is called "Never Mind the Six O'clock News." That was going to be the name of it, and I was going to broadcast. Don't bank that. <laughs> Never mind the Six idea. O'clock News. It's your idea. All right. I want to just make sure that anybody who comes up with that, that is Marlon Mark James' idea. Never mind the Six O'clock I News. Have I shouldn't said that out loud. No, but I really love that. Mm. All right. You're going to go home. I know you're going to go home. You're going to go van and and you're going to put that as a web. You're going to you're going to buy a web domain. I love that because the the yeah, the whole idea is to compete live um with against the news like try to be the alternative like so don't never mind the six o'clock news. Come and watch our channel because I want my channel to be all about good news. Um, good people, the um, and so the the main rules of that broadcast idea that I had was that you're allowed to talk about anything. We can talk about anything except what they're talking about on the six o'clock news. Any right. all of that shit is off the table. Can't talk about politics. You can't talk about the prime minister. You can't talk about COVID fucking nineteen. <laughs> I just want to talk about the happy shit in your life. You know that's how I would like to go about 
a podcast to find well, really put I together really that would believe be beautiful. that from a from <coughs> my own perception this you, this this right now is the birth <laughs> I'm going to hold you Well, to that's it, what right? I was feeling like. That's why I wanted to come and do this with you, just to actually have the experience. The name of this is Life Lesson 101. Yeah. And I, I did it as initially to as a cathartic processing of the grief I had from the yes. death of my wife four years ago. And and I started it, and then life fell to, fell, fell to pieces. It, it, mentally, it fell to pieces. I had depression, anxiety, and whatever. And I didn't get back to it until much later on, in two, begin two thousand, end of two thousand nineteen, that kind of era, like October or something, when I did the first interviews. So that was like a two and a half year, three year gap. But why it's changed, and it, and it needed to change because it couldn't be just about my catharsis. You know, it couldn't be about shedding my old skin, so to speak, of grief and loss. It had to be about giving something back, mm. and. So thus far, you know, I've had a woman who's had agoraphobia who now teaches individuals to stand in front of other people. I mean, that's an amazing story. Agoraphobia to being in front of somebody and teaching. I've had a guy who was, you know, he was very large and short, so he really felt uncomfortable in his body. And now he's he's done bodybuilding and training and he's done that. I've had a, a woman who's you know, through all intents and purposes, was not going to do well in business and now has her own business and what have you. Another individual who, um, who's at stage four cancer, that, that means she's got death, right? I think I told, you heard about it on the, on the podcast. But she's living with it. Yeah. And so all of these are ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And I think you're an extraordinary individual. I think... You've just birthed, and I think you need to do... I, look, I hate saying should. I hate saying must. They're two things that I hate saying. Well, the more affirmative thing to say is, you are going to do it. Well, you, you will. You, you are doing it. Yeah, especially with Katie backing me up over here. Well, isn't that funny? You know, that's what I find... I feel like, the, yeah. like needing... Like, when I have all of these dreams of all of my own self, I feel like a little bit stuck in, like, actually getting the motivation to just go for it. Mm. But like um, having a beautiful person in my life who tells me how much she believes in me and, and that's helping. You do that, really helping Katie? Me. Do you do She's that? like, yeah, we can get a bus. <laughs> we'll drive a bus around. <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> Let's do it. Well, You know, things are getting... I'm so glad I came to Wellington, to be honest. Like, I, I, so, so can I ask, how did you guys meet? On a film set. Uh, are you allowed to tell us what film it is? Well, I don't see why not. Uh, what? Well, Katie, what? Let's, can we? Can we come to you? Can he say it? What? Uh, I don't think we. Yeah, we should. I should be okay. Hopefully, it's not quite out yet. Actually, no. We won't name the title of it in case we're not allowed to. It's in mm -hmm. post production. Right. But I can tell you what the theme of it is. It's a. Um, it was made just after the level four lockdown. Right. Right. So I think whoever wrote. It was heavily influenced by the level four lockdown, and that's where they wrote the script. Because right. then it's this post-apocalyptic film that, um, idea, so um, with warring factions of people fighting over resources after um, pretty much the the normal government has collapsed and most of the population on Earth has died and things like that. So it's just set in a really dire, the, the, dark. The, uh, what's that movie? Um, with Mel Gibson. Oh, Mad Max. Yeah, it's very Mad Maxian and theme. And so the costuming was pretty cool, and everyone's all rugged and dirty and crawling around in the dirt. And um, they got that punkish. Yeah. People with guns and weapons. And my character in the movie had uh, a police baton. The simplicity of that, I quite liked it. And then in my scene, I was completely like. Doing the uh, acting this role out and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it and this 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 character I'm playing is quite the menacing person and I kept having to de deploy this baton for the scene every time we did a take and eventually the baton fell apart because I I'd done it <laughs> so many times that it just went <laughs> and exploded into pieces. 
Yeah, so that was a bit embarrassing because after that they taped it back together and I had to be a bit gentler with it, but it still had to look real and I didn't want it to break again. It was, yeah, I love filmmaking, by the way. We right. really talked about well, that. Well, no, no. Well, we, you know, we just touched on the idea that you uh, were following, <laughs> following the acting dream. But that, that's how you met, though. Yes, on the film set. And it was... Uh, um, it was day two for me on the film set, um, so the first day I went to the film set, it was quite an awesome uh, experience, but there wasn't as many people. And then the next day there was a whole lot more people to do crowd scenes and stuff, and right. Ka Katie was one of them. So um, there was an accident with one of the other actors on the set, and I won't talk too deeply about that but um, mostly required an ambulance <laughs> and uh, we were in a pretty remote location so it took a long time mm -hmm. and uh, see I didn't really talk to Katie on the film set actually that we day. We didn't talk at all. We didn't it talk was... at all but I noticed her and then I also noticed that um, the deep care and empathy she had for this guy that got injured. Um, so she was just right there, like taking care of him while he was grimacing in pain for the whole hour he was waiting for the ambulance to turn up. They didn't send the helicopter. He only had a broken leg and... Um, only it was... It was a terrible break though. Uh, yeah. So, and I was quite concerned. And, and then when the ambulance came up, they had to use this uh, special rescue trolley with just one big rubber wheel, which requires four people to, to operate, especially down a mountain. So uh, I helped to wheel the guy down the, the thing. Bloody so Katie, Katie observed me doing that, and I observed her doing, t doing her part in it. And um, I just, we ended up connecting online afterwards and, right. and just talking about that. and. Yeah. I think that's what really sparked the, the love vibe there was that I just told her that I thought it was really beautiful that she was there for that guy. and, mm. and Neither of us knew this guy. We didn't know him, no. But um, we, that's, that's, that's what it, that's, I mean, that's just humanity though. Like yeah. when someone's hurt, you want to be there and help them out. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's a wonderful thing. I'm going to tell you why, why that, I, that's a wonderful thing. So when I met my wife, she was funny, she was lovely, very beautiful. But the thing that changed my mind, not, not necessarily changed my mind, but, but confirmed why I wanted to marry her, was that she was sitting on the floor in uh, the house where she was working. She used to be a nanny. And she had a friend beside her. And she said to her friend, who have we forgotten? Because I was doing gifts. I, think it, I don't think it was Christmas. It was, I think it was a birthday or something. I can't remember. But, but somehow she was thinking about doing an act of service for somebody. And I couldn't remember this. And when I looked at that, I thought, wow, she's really thinking of someone else. Mm. Now, when I did marry my wife, 15 years after um, marrying her, she turned to me and told me what confirmed or affirmed her reason for marrying me. And it was the fact that I jumped out of the vehicle that we were in and helped push this car off the road. And when I, <laughs> right, when I, yes. when I helped push the car off, and everybody else saw me, a bunch of guys came out of their cars and. Pushed. So I just thought it was quite interesting that you know, um, that's that's the key. We actually like to see it. it look, you're both attractive individuals, aesthetically very pleasing to the eye, right? But here's the thing. Oh, look, you are. You are. It's a beautiful, oh, beautiful right. face. Stop. <laughs> Stop it. But here's the key. No matter how beautiful we are aesthetically, yeah. actually what we want to see is the humanity in the other individual. I really feel that. Um, and, I, and I think that's a wonderful story that, you know, is that humanity, that's compassion. Uh, apart from the fact that, you know, She's so nice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, she is. But on set, on set, I had um, soot rubbed into my face, and I had black crosses on my eyes, and carrying my steel pole and running around yelling. So, <laughs> oh my it god, was, it was a different story. Then. But it's very much that's not the picture I have of you here. <laughs> you, you, you seem like you know you'd be just as happy to to sit where you are rather okay. than. Yeah. But I mean, you you did say earlier on when we were off camera that you were getting into acting. I'm. I'm definitely pushing myself to face my challenges. So I'm very much an introvert and 
I actually have selective mutism, which means some situations I can't physically speak because of anxiety. So, um, yeah, it was it was a huge, huge thing for me to go to the set. Well, I think it's an even huger thing for you, actually, to be speaking. Indeed. <laughs> it means it's a comfortable it a space. And, well, great. and when I asked her if she wanted to come, um, she expressed a bit of, like, nervousness. Mm. Like, oh, what are you asking for me? You know, like, yeah. and, and that's that's the anxiety talking, and then you've got to get past that. And, like, and I, I, was just, I just said to her, it was ha- easier to explain with my voice, like when I was with her talking to her, than it was when we were messaging each other. I feel yeah. um, the messaging her just, I think her responses were a bit like freaking out, like, <laughs> oh, I don't know. And, but, and then, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just was like, look, it's going to be a cool thing. Like, Charles is a cool dude. Wait till you meet him. And he's got this nice studio set up and everything. So, a cool just selling her on it, you know? <laughs> yeah. I will disagree with that. <laughs> well, uh, well, the reason why I say moron is, uh, and it's not to put myself down, actually. Moron, no. It's just really to say to you that I don't know much. I yeah. don't actually know much. And don't that's, know much, but I know I love you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? Uh, just on that, uh, uh, God bless Aaron Neville, all right? But Aaron Neville, and I, I've, I've got this lovely friend over in the States called uh, Karen O'Connor, and she once pointed this out to me, that Aaron Neville's vibrato is the worst vibrato ever in popular history, in popular culture, in popular um, music. I don't know how much, but I know I love you. God, whatever happened to a, a lovely tone like... I'm not going to demonstrate. What was I saying? Oh, yes. I don't know what the fuck we were saying. So you were talking we? about explaining to us why you call yourself a moron. Oh, yeah, well, no, but anyway... But, but it's, but it's just what... Um, it's, just, it's just why I love people telling me stuff I don't know. And, yeah, I, and I've loved, exactly. you know, the idea of... The, because you've got this kind of multifaceted... I mean, Kate brings some colour into your life that was, wasn't otherwise there. And you already had this very colourful life. Yeah. So yeah, but I want to know... A, I have a little you? bit of trouble appreciating my own self. So that's why I think the love energy coming from Katie, telling me that she appreciates me. It really helps me to properly realise it for myself within my own self and I felt that's been a really beautiful and uplifting. But I know that loving myself is my own responsibility so just, that's what it's revived in me is like an increased focus on loving myself. I, uh, I just got to focus on that because mm. there's a lot of criticism of the phrase you complete me. Yeah, yeah, I know. And Complete I yourself, un- man. Yeah, that's right. A lot of people say, oh, you, you, you know, you don't Take need... Take ownership. It. Yeah, you don't know, need... Yeah, right. You don't need anybody else, right? Okay? And I just like to challenge that a little bit. Yeah. Because I have a psychotherapist, and I spoke to him about this idea of, you know, the you complete me kind of, hey, we're going to get rid of that as a, as a mode of, of explaining, you know, the need for another individual. Well, look, who, ha- who deals with your rubbish? It's the guys in the truck. They complete me. <laughs> I don't get yes. rid of my own shit. Okay? All right. So, wait a minute. Who builds my house? They complete me, whoever those people are. Who fixes my legs? It's the nurses. It's the doctors who do They complete me. And so, those are all physical things. I have a psychotherapist. Now, you, he enables me to deal with childhood trauma, life trauma, grief, loss, and all those kind of things. What he does is enable, he facilitates an operational or a lack of an operational function in certain parts of my brain, which I'm not able to access unless I have somebody else, him, who is saying, Charles, think about this. Sit with this moment. Sit with this emotion. That's the therapeutic response. Right. There is a therapist sitting in the corner over there. I know, there, right? Right? In the form of Katie. Yeah. Now, and, and my wife, for me, was a therapist. At the same way I was for her. But I was a different kind of therapist. Yeah. I was sponta- spontaneity. I was, you could do it. I was the motivational speaker mm. for my wife. My wife thought that she couldn't do a number of things, believe it or not. And for those of you who knew my wife who are watching this, it's true. Wilhelmina had her own issues about... P- performance in certain areas of her life, whether or not she could publicly speak, whether or not she was able to get through an exam, all those kind of things. And I would just talk to her as if it was just old news. 
<laughs> well, of course, you, yeah, of course you can do it. Well, what makes you think that you can't? Yeah. And she, um, matter of fact, in one of the life lesson videos you'll see is, you know, I didn't think very much of me in an aesthetic way. I thought I was ugly. And she said to me once, she said, this was her being a therapist, right? And although she wouldn't have called it that, she mm. was just being a loving... It's a therapeutic response. It's a therapeutic response. And it was this idea of... She said, don't you trust my judgment? <laughs> and when I heard that, I thought, oh, my God, me attacking myself and my inability to acknowledge how handsome or likable I am was me saying, you don't choose very well. <laughs> yes. You know, so I mean, what, and from my point of view, and this is me coming in and, and, and talking to you two um, as, a, as, a, as a unit, so to speak, I don't think it's codependency because you've been able to live with yourself on your own and function perfectly well as a human being. And Katie, obviously with four children, and I don't know the rest of the details about mm -hmm last partners or whatever, you're obviously functioning in the mode of mother and doing, at least for Marlon's, I can imagine Marlon wouldn't want to be with anybody who didn't function very well. And obviously you're functioning very well. So there is that, but that isn't codependency. That's interdependency. When both of you are independent, but your independent natures come and say to one another, I like your independence, I like your independence together, we then become a, a unified functioning body. And that's why when you say, hey, look, you know, I have this, it's not that I didn't love myself, but I needed to love myself even more. Yeah. Sometimes you can only do that when you get the appropriate mirror. Katie's the mirror. And it's a mirror of words, it's a mirror of ideas, it's a mirror of thoughts, it's a mirror of being, it's a mirror of spirit, spirituality. Mm -hmm. I'm a singing teacher. I'm a mirror. And what I do is I say to somebody, well, this image doesn't look as good as this image. And, and I think that's why, Marlon, when you talk about this, this idea of Katie coming into your life and you know all these wonderful ideas that seem to be germinating, it's because somebody's actually believing the fact that you have a dream and it's worth it's worth something. It has a value. It's beyond. It's beyond mockery. Mm. Providing the sunshine, right? You already uh, had to see. I've always providing the sunshine. I've always <laughs> found myself functioning best in an environment where I'm managed. I'm, I'm not the best at self management. This is just, you know, uh, recognizing myself. But man. When, when I'm working for other people or part of a team, like on the film sets, or if I'm playing a role uh, as a character in a movie or something, I am just so good at that. And like um, lapping up other people's dreams and visions and ideas and just going, yep, let's do it. I can help you make that happen and making it happen. I'm so good at that. I so just, that's I, really honest as well, by the yeah. way. Yeah, I'm I'm really good at that, and 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 then I've got an ordinary day job these days, and man, I'm good at that, and we're all good at that, and me and my team that we work at just throwing truckloads of freight around Wellington City, like it's not the easiest city to work in, <laughs> it's um, but yeah, it's it's good exercise too. So yeah. th th this I like productivity, I like mm. getting exhausted basically. Um, it, but yeah, then my dreams just sort of stay my dreams and I get exhausted doing these other things that I'm so good at because they're paying the bills and mm. and I don't make much effort towards like... Your own dreams. Yeah, and um, but that's changing. I can feel that changing. Yeah. Um, well, I feel it changing now. I feel like, mm. I feel like um, just having a conversation with you actually has inspired me because there's so many individuals who are locked in a pattern of negativity and I th and your idea of don't listen to the six o'clock news <laughs> yeah is that the name never mind never mind the, the six o'clock news, news. Um, it's a bit of a reference to nirvana in there all right what was that <laughs> what was their one it was the album called never mind all right right nirvana never mind wasn't wasn't it, Is it am i right hey look it was what, it when, when did he when did he die he did in he died in 96 didn't he or 93 mm, i can't remember Kurt Cobain, mm. 
Yeah, I can't remember. I was pretty young back then. Yeah, I was. I was tw- well, in '93. I was 24. In, uh, well, how old are you? In '93, I was 10. Wow. I'm the same age as my camper van, by the way. That's, <laughs> that's why. That's why I chose it because I want. I, when I decided to get a camper van, I said I want one that's the same age as me. So I typed in 1983 camper van in my searches, and that's what came up as my favourite out of all the possibilities for that year. And it happens to be a matte black painted ambulance. But she's there's, there's just just in that one simple bit of your history shows incredible difference it's just a, yeah it's a symbolism yeah. it's a um it's poetic license it's what what statement do i want to make like mm. vehicles being kind of an extension to your ego or something like that but <laughs> but uh oh god if you look at my vehicle tiny <laughs> uh, now if you hear some banging by the way that is a living family oh yes hustling and bustling in the home Mm. It's one of the things I really like about working from home um, is that it enables me, I can be here, make the dinner if I, if they, if I, if I don't ask them to, but, you know, make the dinner, t- do some teaching. I do love my lifestyle in many ways. Um, I, and I long for a, a lovely lady just like you to join me in my dreams of being doing this kind of thing where you work from home you're and and the thing about the kind of thing what you're you're saying you know um interviewing in the street never mind the six o'clock news this idea of helping people with nutrition with katie and and other parts and i'm sure there's so many other parts to you katie and i'm so sorry if i if i insult you by narrowing narrowing Mm -hmm. down just to one area because i know everybody has many facets um is that i love the fact that it's it's not buying into the clickbait you know the negative, like, you know, Hunter Biden. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Or whatever, or, or whatever it is, you know, like, um, what, what, did you ever see that video? It made me laugh. It was, it, they called it the mask debate. Mm. So people are debating whether to wear the mask. The Say mask. that Ameri- fast. Hey? Say that 10 times fast. That's right. <laughs> and there's these whole loads of American channels, and they're going, and what's now turned into a mask debate, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, everybody's talking about this mask debate. Where do you stand on the mask debate? <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. Do, you, do, you, do you think the mask debate is valid? Do you think, do you think, the mask debate even really needs to be a thing. <laughs> That's what they do. There's a whole load of these people talking about the, the mask debate. <laughs> oh. oh dear. So, so okay. So, tell us a bit about where you were born and your childhood and and, and the dreams you had then. Astronaut. Sorry, dreams I had when I was the youngest. The youngest first thing I thought I would want to be. And like that carried on for a little while. I don't think I really gave up hope until I got to high school. But all through primary school, I was like, I'm going to be an astronaut. Oh, and I wanted to join the Air Force because that's pretty much the first step. And then I just sort of realised, ah, oh, I'm from New Zealand. New Zealanders don't become astronauts. Like a <laughs> right. But we do have a space program here now. You so. do. But guy, what's the last name of that guy? Is it Peak? Peter, it's Peter somebody, isn't is it? There a, is there a Kiwi astronaut yeah, these days? Um, he's not a Kiwi astronaut. Uh, actually, I would say that out the back of my head. He may well be. His name's Peter something. Oh, his last name's Peak. Hmm. But, you know, he's currently launching little satellites. Oh, yeah. From yeah. from New Zealand turf, I think. Yeah. And there's, yeah, there's, uh, there's at least one I, I heard of, of a, um, a launch site built in Christchurch or nearby. Mm. Um, and I heard about that like 10 years ago, so right. it's been going for a while. And I guess they're launching satellites and things. or mm. well, we, we, You know, the them. New Zealand Space Agency, it's quite quite, quite impressive, isn't it? In private company. I haven't actually really researched it that much or, no. or cared much about it, just mm. seen the odd article come up. But you said it. you wanted to be an astronaut uh, and then go Air Force. I mean, where, where, were, you, where were you born? Auckland. Where, whereabouts? Pitt Street. 
I thought there was a Pitt Street. That's a famous street now. Watch out. Pitt Street. Well, the hospital this I was born in is gone. It was replaced by apartment buildings. Um, so, yeah. And then I went to go and try and find the first house that I lived in. Well, actually, technically, the house I was gestated in. Because <laughs> my mum was living there while that was taking place. And then I was born, and then it was my first house. I went to try and find that, and that's gone because it got bulldozed and replaced with a big shopping centre thing. So that's uh, my my first, what would be my first house that I, that still exists. But I went to all of my houses one day I, uh, on Street View, sorry. I oh, was yeah, like, yeah. I remember all the houses that I've lived in and I've moved house so many times during my life. My, my mother had a very transient life with us in my youth. Um, I changed school 20 times. Right. Um, and we'd lived all over between floating between Auckland and the Bay of Plenty mm. um, around the intermediate years or pushing towards the end of primary school beginning of intermediate I lived in the far north of the island up north right at the top right at the top near Kaitaia etc uh, and uh, calmed down the changing of schools effect after intermediate school and I only went to two high schools, um, and in the, uh, the, the my senior, um, no, sorry, my first high school was Edgecombe College in the Bay of Plenty, and then I moved on for the sixth and seventh form, the last two years of school, to Hamilton Boys High School, and then, yeah, I went on my OE for a year, I went over to England and Ireland and spent six what months you, in what each. Did you, what did you enjoy? Did you enjoy... England and Ireland and so oh yeah totally in England Ireland was more enjoyable in some ways mostly because I made more money uh, <laughs> I had a real job right. when I first went overseas it was to go and do this uh, volunteer visa right. job um, which they couldn't weren't allowed to really pay you much except right. a little allowance but they fed you and they housed you and I worked on an adventure camp for kids um, so we had kids from all over Europe coming all through the summer and I was throwing them off an abseil tower uh, on a rope of course and just some of them were a little bit scared and slow and some of them were just like jumping down the thing and then straight back up for another go like yeah so all the whole spectrum of fear levels uh, that's a, that's that was just my favourite activity to do, and the one I I spent the most time doing during that summer mm. was abseil, teaching the kids how to go down, throw them off a wall, off a tower, uh, and then then there was all these other activities like bloody motorsports and uh, rifles and archery and challenge courses and those little sailboats mm -hmm. and dragon boating and. Ah, oh, there's probably a lot, uh, plenty more um, forest walks. That was one of my favourite activities, was just grab a bunch of kids and go, well, we're going on the forest walk. Just take them for the forest walk. It was so easy. Let's just walk for ages through the forest. I remember, though, because I'd never seen a squirrel in my life before. Oh, God, yeah. When I saw the squirrel, my first squirrel, I was like, a squirrel! <laughs> and, of course, they would have seen it before. And the it? kids have all seen squirrels before, so they're, they're just like, it's just a squirrel. And this reminds me of when I was in Ireland. I was in a rock band when I was in Ireland. and uh, oh, what, what do you play? I was singing in that band, but cool. I play guitar and I can play drums a little bit. You know, not no expert on it, but... I can come up with a beat and go, yeah, can you play this beat? Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, give your drum kits back. <laughs> you, <laughs> but, you have a really small fucking drum kit, really. <laughs> the tiniest little one. <laughs> from chicken. Could, you, could you play this, please? <laughs> the chicken legs. <laughs> anyway. Um, so in a rock band. So I've seen snow mm -hmm. plenty of times yeah. growing up. I went skiing on the Ruapehu when I was 12 or 13. I can't remember how old I was. Um, I think I was 13, and um, and I'd seen snow on the side of the road going on the desert road when I was a kid on school trips, and but I'd never ever seen snow fall from the sky. But I was standing in in the streets in Dublin with my bandmates, and the snow started falling from the sky, <laughs> and this is the first time I ever seen this, and I started going, it's snowing. Snow! Snow and snowing! So snow and squirrels. <laughs> and my bandmates go, it's only snow. <laughs> you know, it's only snow, dude. <laughs> I'm 
like, but I've never seen it all by the sky before. <laughs> yeah, it was a good one, good moment. There's a childlikeness to that, isn't there? It's kind of really lovely going, wow. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Innocence. I've got heaps of cool stories. We could do podcast after podcast after podcast. Just uh, I've got all these cool. Well, I'm enjoying stories talking to you history. because I mean, it's mm. you know, you, you, you got this colourful life, and so I am interested in your future. Mm. So I mean, if I, I can just see where you, what I've learned about you. First of all, you dream, but you but your dream is it's it's, it's dreams that I think can be actualized. You yeah. know, yeah, they're not out of reach. No. They're real dreams, okay? And the fact is, is that, you know, you can buy a black painted ambulance van and make it your home for a while, I think is kind of cool. <laughs> I mean, the other thing I like is, I mean, you just touched on the fact that you, you know, you're working with children and you did this abseiling and all that kind of stuff, and I thought that's really cool. Um, but you also had that childlike response to, and the excitement of seeing the squirrel and everything else like that. <laughs> so I find that really cool. I mean, I mean it, I, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm trying to set you up to in a, into a place where you realise that you shouldn't lose those wonderful kind of discovering new things. Look at it. Look at how you do it. You, 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 you lived right there. You lived the moment with the snow. <laughs> Fucking snow. <laughs> you know. Um, and there's... A, there's a, I, I, I know people who lose their dreams. And snow is a burden. And the weather's a burden. I mean, I know I sometimes say it. I'm a pom. I'm allowed to say it. Where is summer right now? But... <laughs> um, Look at look at. I just think I just think there's so much that you have that's going to blossom very soon. Yeah, Katie. <laughs> I am the sunshine. <laughs> you are the sunshine. <laughs> oh gosh, I like that. Well, she's the fire. I'm I'm the air. <laughs> if you go by that astrological, oh, is that right? Fairy stuff that they. The fairy stuff. The he eerie fairy. Oh, the eerie fairy stuff. Uh, I was talking to somebody about that recently. I was talking about, you know, so for instance... I'm a pig, by the way, and Chinese, um, <laughs> Chinese I'm a, star signs or whatever I'm a, it is. <laughs> I'm a rooster or a chicken, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've just burnt out the mic. I no. have pet chickens. Do you? Mm -hmm. I'm and a cow. And a cow. I'm a cow. You're a cow. Oh, sorry. Oh, but she's a Chinese cow. That is cow. not a good thing to put around. <laughs> so a pig and a cow. Huh? They, they get on, all right? Well, they do, don't they? They can share the same environment, can't they? Yeah. Can they? No, they all do, actually. Yeah, they do, right? I Chickens, think, pigs and cows. I think the dragon's the one that just fucks everything up. She goes, <laughs> that could be a mother-in-law. What other animals are they? Oh, there's a rat, eh? Hey? Oh, oh. oh, someone's flushed the toilet. I don't think that's toilet. I think that is the washing machine. Oh, OK. I can tell. Yeah, you would be able to. No, um, that might be toilet. Would your microphone have heard that? I could do. I mean, I can always. We know. just got distracted and went. <laughs> squirrel. <laughs> squirrel. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see how in sync we were? Yeah, there? that's right. We both. We both thought about both so no. in tune. Like, it's happening all the time with her and I. That's so that's why it's a great thing about us being in love and and teaming up and. Well, to be honest, I mean, I I, I would I just I feel like I should have a kind of spiritual roaming camera on you both. You know, they're kind of like an eye in the sky. And then, you know, like every six months you come back and say, hey, look, this is where we've come with our dreams. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's a good idea. Yeah. And and I, and I when you do come back, I mean, that kind of thing, it's not over yet because I, I, I just love this chat. It's really cool. Um, I mean, to me, if I was going to label this... this um, um, Isn't that not really? Oh. Yeah. What I must say is that something that you might have missed off camera is that whilst I was talking to... Um, uh, Marlon earlier on. Uh, Marlon Mark James. Marlon Mark James. Uh, Marlon was looking for some water, but Katie, very, very quietly, making sure that she didn't bump her own microphone, sneaked and over That's here right. and sneaked poured me a glass. a glass of water. And, uh, and I, I didn't even notice. Didn't even notice, you see. <laughs> I was sitting here going, damn, I have to go pour myself some water soon. <laughs> and I didn't even look until now. 
Well, I always carry a colostomy bag. With it's me. a bit hard to see though, because that light is so. I know. <laughs> but you're looking good, man. You're looking good. I, I know. like. That's you're the point looking of it. better on camera, man. I want a couple of lights like these for my. For my, well, my dream of interviewing people on the side of the street, it's got to look like this <laughs> in the street, and that will draw attention. People will stand around going, what's going on in yeah. here? And, yeah. I, I've just been very <laughs> blessed with a good friend of mine, who's my business associate, called Vlad, and he supplied me with these lights. Uh, he's great at camera work and everything else. I know. So I was, I, you know, I... I, I, I'm a musician. I'm a moron. <laughs> you know, I, I'm a moron. I'm a moron. <laughs> yeah, fuck. But if you if you listen to um, what's that famous podcast that Joe, Joe Rogan, Joe Rogan guy, he's always calling himself a moron. Well, that's where I got the expression he from. Goes, don't take it from me, guys. Like I I, I don't mm. know for sure because I'm a fucking meathead. Well, that's right. <laughs> that's but that's the thing, you know. But uh, the, the, I I don't know enough about life, people. Um, this is my opportunity to look at people's lives. I mean, I love this. I love this. This yeah. is the thing that kind of drives me. And I think I've been a bit, I've dried up a little bit because I didn't do this. And so I love this. I love this discovery, you know, um, a double discovery. It's interesting, that dynamic, though, because you sort of have to be a little bit defensive because of how large the audience could possibly be and there will always be the cynical bastards out there who go oh look at this guy thinks he fucking knows it all you know <laughs> but that's where i i've it took me a disclaimer long... i don't actually make any claim to knowing it all you know that's, yeah, well, the, point but the, of it. But that's the thing you see i mean a lot of people are, i mean this is where i want to change language a little bit and i don't want to change language but i wish that people would choose a different language so uh, people have adopted for the past, I think, 10 years, the word haters. So when someone says a negative comment, somebody will say, all you haters out there. All you haters out there, you can get a skip for. Yeah, look, I don't think they hate anybody. I honestly think they don't. I think they, they lack a funnel or uh, opportunity to speak um, in a way which is constructive and their lives have been narrowed into just one area, and that is spending eight hours doing this, the master of only one dimension. And when they write a negative comment, the negative comment is purely a vent, generally an unhealthy vent, for a place where they cannot articulate any other value than to say that they either don't like something or anything else. And look, don't get me wrong, I was caught up in that, especially within music. Okay. And it took me a little little while, not very long, but you know, a good couple of years to pull myself out of that environment where nobody builds anything. There's nobody building anything. What do you construct when you say, hey man, you're fucking useless? You don't construct anything. And so I find it more valuable to have from somebody who says, I agree with this point because, however, I would consider this other point. Mm. So that sounds like... That's what you mean by changing the language. Changing the Making language. Making it peaceful and kind. Pa peaceful and, and kind, but you can be... It's the same message. It's the it's same message. It's just the language yeah, is the language not as articulate um, when someone just, you know, barks look, at you. Look, and, it's easy to call someone a C. <laughs> I was actually going to say the whole word. <laughs> oh, don't do that. You'll get us banned. <laughs> no. no. We might have to edit it. <laughs> Listen, if you use the C word on here, I'm not bothered by it at all. Gosh, in the Chocolate. UK. Hey? Chocolate. Chocolate. Choc <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, do you, know, do, you remember, do you remember the first viral vi video on YouTube? As far as I'm aware, the first viral one? Oh, I don't know. Chocolate rain. Do you remember Chocolate Rain? No, I'm going to look it up now. Look up Chocolate Rain. It's okay. This kid, he made up this song called Chocolate Rain. And he did this thing, right? So he didn't want to have his breath on the microphone. So he used to go, <gasps> Chocolate Rain. And you can see him singing like this. <laughs> wow. Um, so, so I think we're going to... A, I was listening to a chat, and he said that this environment... Okay, so that... That's the washing machine. Mm. There's no way that can be a P. 
Well, or a flush. <laughs> Unless you have to have a continuous flush, just be holding it down. <laughs> yes, I don't think that shit has gone down yet. Marlon, yeah. where's that cat? On, on the to- topic of ownership, we've got ownership. a um, portable toilet thing. Oh, yeah. It's, a, it's compostable? It's uh, a pour down a dump station kind of oh, right. one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there apparently are eco-friendly chemicals you can use right. in the, within the cleaning system and everything so that you could actually uh, dump it in nature and it wouldn't do too much harm. Right. But apart from that, it's poop, you know, which does what it does. Well, poop's about there to decay, isn't it? Mm, right. I mean, this is why I say, you know, we are supposed to decay humans. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's something quite exciting about that. I was talking to Katie about how, you know, was because it's about caring for the animals. Our topic of conversation was that, and, yeah. and hunting, right. and whether we would hunt. And uh, my idea is like, well, elk, elk. If, uh, you know, like, because I'm talking about giving up meat, you know, mm. and um, Katie doesn't eat meat, right? And, and so. Um, and she has been making me all sorts of lovely food that doesn't have meat in it, by the way. Right. And it doesn't need it. It's, it's just tasty and good and, and everything. Um, but I'm, anyway. going off, I'm going off Katie already. <laughs> the, 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 I used to go that. hunting and fishing and all that. Yeah. But the, the, the thing is, I was like, I still, you know, if I do fully give up meat, I'll, I'll, I'll still like to eat meat if I'm allowed to ha- have it. Only if I hunt it at myself, you know, I've still got to have that possibility. But who knows? By the time I, if I, let's say, fully get off eating meat, and then I've done that for so many years, Disclaimer, who totally knows if I'm? <laughs> so say it again. Disclaimer: Totally his choice. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. No. That's right. <laughs> but I see the value in it. I mm. see the value in not supporting the commercial meat products in this fucking ugly farmland society mm. that we well, have. You're not going to believe this, but this is the second conversation I've had today about this. And and I'm a meat eater. Um, and I was saying that I'm a bit of a pragmatic. And the individual who um, I was talking to, she said that um, it was very, I was being very honest about this because my pragmatism in terms of my facility for eating meat outweighs my compassion for, for the farm, for the farm animal. Now, don't get me wrong. If you want to have a conversation about poor farming methods, that's the one I want to have a conversation about. I want to have a conversation about why we cannot simply change our farming methods so that I don't see somebody hanging a pig upside down whilst it's still alive and and beating it to death and electric shocking it. I don't think that's necessary. I was on a rare breed. So we just have robots do that job for well, us no, no. and hide it away where we can. Well, no, no. See I it. mean, obviously not doing that. But <laughs> I, I was on a rare breed. Well, was that's a... what they're doing in some places, right. like the the chicken farms with the food supply, which slowly gets higher and higher off the ground, so that the little runty ones die because they can't reach the food because they right. don't want the big survivors. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah. and and then it's somebody's job to wade through all these bloody chickens to get the bodies out and throw them out. Mm. So. Well, you know, I, I just think that we can, I think we can be more compassionate. Um, but like I say, my, my pragmatism, my facility for meat that's cheap is outweighs my compassion. But my pragmatic side says, my daughter did a stint a few years ago, two weeks, on um, a, uh, a rare breeds farm. And what did they do with the pig? They shot the pig. And that's, that's the, you know, they shot it and it was dead immediately. They didn't electric shock it. They didn't put it in water. They didn't mince it up whilst it was alive. They shot it and they ate it, head and all, at their table. And on this rare breeds farm, y- you have rare breeds and he, and he looks after them um, and what I want to see is that over the next 20 years because it's going to take at least that long we see a new generation of farmers who take over these old farms who have more compassion and we see old farming methods bit by bit taken and and this will take some regulation I understand that dismantle yeah. but I'm also aware <laughs> uh, from my own point of view, I was a vegan for seven months, and that was in 2012, 2012. I ha- all of a sudden I had this massive energy, 
But what I didn't account for was that over a period of time, I would be losing iron and the um, B12, you know, the, the immediate access to, you know, uh, uh, that, that, those vitamins and nutrients. So I got back into eating meat, but I got back to eating meat in the smaller amounts and as lean as I could get it. And whilst I was financially able to, I was eating organic chicken, organic everything. My wife and I started to buy that kind of stuff. But I, I think we all, can always have a discussion about how well we do things right across the board. How well do we farm? How well do we care? Always we can have that discussion. At the end of the day, I want people to have the choice, you know. Well, I remember the choice when I was young was my parents would, they owned some cows and when they wanted to eat one, they'd have it destroyed and um, and cut up and then it would go in the freezer. I think they would sell the other half of it because we only fit half the cow in the freezer at a time. <laughs> All right. So um, That was a big freezer anyway. It was a big freezer, <laughs> yeah. But there's something about whenever we had the cow, it was the same cow, you know? Right. I really liked that dynamic of, like, we had a cow, and now we're eating the cow, and we got the same... We, when every time we have beef, it's our, it's our cow that, right. you know, we bought, paid for, slaughtered, and chucked in the freezer. I, I like that more than if you're going to the supermarket and just grabbing little pieces of all these cows from all over the country, mm. you know, or wherever the hell they came from. Right. And it's the same with all meat products and all the animals like where the fuck they I'd rather have had my own one of those animals mm. bought it up taken care of it care of it myself and then eat it if I so choose yeah yeah I'm not, and I know where that chicken's been sorry I'm thinking about your chickens because I don't know if we're going to eat we probably yeah, won't eat, eat them we won't eat <laughs> them but, chickens. but we're eating rescue chickens but we'll, we'll eat their eggs right yeah because they're our eggs you know that's the well I, I knew a guy that's how we go with that one. Oh, a guy who said he wouldn't eat the eggs because he believed they were the souls of the chickens. Wow. Well, you know? You're well, shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically chicken period, right? <laughs> chicken there's period. No, if it's not fertilised, there's no, there's no soul in it. So. Mm. Chicken period. <laughs> I love the way you... <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, can I ask you a question? This is a question that I haven't asked for a long time, even of myself. Who was the person that milked the cow the first time? And what well, did they think they I, were well, doing? I, thought, I, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> but I thought, what, who was the person who said the next thing that falls out of that chicken's ass I'm going to eat? <laughs> <laughs> who did that? Right? Who who said that falls out of an ass of a chicken, and it's therefore nutritious? Well, you'll see primates raiding nests, eating chickens' eggs. So, Katie, what's your um, nickname for the eggs? Uh, there's a few of them. Butt nugget. Butt nugget. I knew that would be butt the first. Nugget. She calls them butt, butt nuggets. nuggets. That's brilliant. I was listening to comedian Andy Andrews, and he he was a very inquisitive child, and this was about 20 years ago. And he said, he was said to his mum when he was really young. He said, "Ma, are those chicken eggs?" She said, "Yeah, they they are." I mean, like from living, like real chickens. Yes, darling, they are. In that box, in that cotton? Yes, Stein, they are. He said, how did they get the chickens to sit so closely together? <laughs> <laughs> how did they get them to, to do, lay the eggs right into these containers? <laughs> I thought they built a nest, ma'am. That's an interesting role play, that one. Yeah. Um, so... I'm trying to piece all of this together because there's so much just floating around. You know, veganism, dreams, buses. Oh, at least we we have ideas and ideals. Um, the other thing I, I feel strongly about, uh, especially in New Zealand, is the kids' charities and, mm. and the uh, anything that will help to bring our suicide rates down because they're... <laughs> They're fucking off the charts here in New Zealand. It's sad. Yeah, I was talking to a good friend of mine uh, in England, and I, and they said, you know, do I do I do I still like living in New Zealand? 
I do. I mean, I really do. And effectively, Belmont is the country in the suburbs. Yeah, I you know, like Belmont. The, mm, I'm in the hills, surrounded by trees. And birds, and beautiful birds. sounding birds. I hear tuis and all kinds of things around here. And um, what's those big birds? Oh, what are they called? Ka, ka, ka. Uh, kiriru. Yeah, kiriru. Te kiriru. We, we had a couple of kiriru's just sitting in the trees. Mm. Big, massive. Oh. Yeah, it's just brilliant. Do it again. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but I'm trying to bring this back to the suicide, but I was speaking to her her and she said you know, do I still love living in New Zealand and I said well yes I do I said but New Zealand has its issues alcohol um, domestic violence suicide those those all those things and <clears throat> it's really funny you know you can have an image of this wonderful Lord of the Rings country mm. um, where there's a perception that surely in this country of just five million people, you're not living on top of one another, so surely that can't be an issue. <clears throat> and I think that we're only living in like tiny portions of the land, and the, most of the country is empty. Mm. Like it's not, we're, it's not, we're not really living on all of the land. We are sort of still piling in on top of each other. Like we need these dense cities to. For what reason? I don't know. Well, I'm, if you evenly spread us out across the nation, we'd have heaps of space each. <laughs> yet we all choose to be all crammed into neighbourhoods. Well, I think you uh, say choose. I mean, I think that's well, because of you know, created in the way. industrial kind of markets that we've created, we've come to this centralised working environment. Mm -hmm. But I, th I think there are a number of things that are going to change over the next twenty to maybe even ten years. Um, Elon Musk's brother. Uh, is uh, a farmer, but he farms in containers. Oh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> and what he does is that in suburbia, you can have a container. And what you do is in that container is all the weather that you want to uh, have, you know, uh, uh, over a season, but it's totally controlled. So the lighting in there can be the lighting of the sunshine in Italy. Uh, it can be the rainfall of Italy. You know, it can be, and you can grow everything that you would usually grow in Italy in your suburb in a container. Mm. So it's a bit like having a greenhouse, but with no windows. And what you're doing is that <clears throat> you're creating the environment for fresh fruit and vegetables, all organically grown, uh, just with your, um, with with the with the with, but with the conditions that are suitable all year round for producing these these wonderful vegetables. That's cool. And I imagine it'd be like kind of like artificial intelligence. Just go, well, what uh, what climate do we need? And well, what that's right. That's what it does. And it's all computer programmed. Yeah. And so what I see is farmland that we use right now becoming <clears throat> either suburbs or new forest we start growing again mm. we start living slightly more off the land because in actual fact if you think about it if you <coughs> pardon me sorry everybody if we start having these centralized farmers in suburbs hydroponics you know we start having those kind of farms within the suburbs not on the farmland that it has to be shipped in so we get independent communities being run you could actually have people who are interested i mean i've got a big old garden out the back i'm really interested in growing stuff um i don't always i'm not brilliant at it um but that's what i see i see us becoming more independent and smaller communities so we have compassion in front of our eyes i see those people that see no hope in life i see them being looked after within smaller communities and I think that's what we're missing. We're missing the eye that we'd use. I, I was talking to James Butters, and I, one of the things I said is that our grandparents used to be our psychotherapists, but we've shoved them away in homes. Our grandparents were the ones who used to be the ones who used to look after the problems that we had with our interaction with mum and dad. Yeah. But we shoved them away. We all, all grandparents and all grandchildren, they always love each other. And so for the first 
18 to 20 years of that child's life, roughly, you've got a psychotherapist who doesn't cost anything, who gives them all the wisdom of a 70, 80, 60, 70, 80 year old individual, who we're now shoving away. So Mr. Mr. I cannot take life anymore, doesn't really see this vivant living human actively participating in their lives. We say if you're old and infertile, in, no, and infirm, not infertile. Infertile and Sorry infirm. About. And infirm, <laughs> shove your way. You're useless. You no longer belong here because you're old. And the Eastern country, like Japan, doesn't do that. Japan absolutely adores its elders. So mm. I think suicide is one thing, but I th suicide isn't a cause. <laughs> you know, suicide is a result. We don't have a problem with suicide. Yes, we do, of course. But our problem is... The problem is the cause. Is the, yes, what, that the, the cause is. It's how we nurture somebody yeah. who feels that they have no value. Or that, as one individual wrote to his mother and father, I have a perfectly happy life, but I can't see me contributing to the future. Why not? Why doesn't he share your dreams, Mark? What, what is it about you that's well, kept I, you alive? Yeah. Marlon, what's kept you alive? What makes you able to dream? Uh, there's just a, a real desire to explore the world and, and meet cool people and, mm. and encourage them on their journey. Mm. Like, and I guess like the coolest people that come your way are, are people who also encourage me on my journey, you know, and um, yeah, I was just thinking about, because you sparked off a thought for me, was, uh, some people's life dynamic changes if they get sick with like a terminal illness or something. Um, and someone was telling me a story today, just a stranger that I was talking to, well, you know, a flit in and out I of my life. I don't think type strangers person. exist in your. Yeah, world. <laughs> well, you know, brief encounters. If yeah. You don't. If you don't get their phone number, you're never talking again unless yeah, you bump yeah. into each other randomly and happen to remember that you met once randomly. But anyway, yeah, he was just saying to me about he was he was admiring the the whole bus concept and going, oh yeah, I had a mate, he had a bus, but then he got cancer and and he thought, fuck it, I'll just sell it. So he sold his bus so that he could use the money to enjoy the last of his years and and, and before he got too sick and whatever. Yeah. And while you were talking before, I was thinking about how we had the referenda, the um, the selection for our government this year, and and there's basically another word for it is assisted suicide. I yeah, guess yeah. So that what yeah. they call it euthanasia. euthanasia. Yeah. yeah, and so that's an interesting dynamic that's come on over our country. And I, I'm not really sure if I've really even processed mm. that. Uh, it's still not in law that's yet. That's been passed though, hasn't it? The, the, the referendum passed, I th I th but was not I, for cannabis. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the, now the referendum passing is just. Uh, a measurement of the people's desire to have the bill passed in Parliament, and mm. I don't think it's actually been passed in Parliament right. yet. So it's still time to blow up Parliament. Uh, sorry, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, when, when we, you know, free speech <laughs> excludes the desire to maim or kill. Or I know you're not allowed to say George Bush. Oh, sorry, I mean what's his name? Donald Trump. <laughs> well, you're not allowed to say it. You're not allowed to say I'm going to kill the president oh, right, of yeah. the United States yeah. of America. Although Madonna did. Did she? Well, she can probably get away with it. Well, that's that's you see, here's Don another. will be like, sit on my face, bitch. Oh my god. Give me this water, please. <laughs> I need some more water. Do you? Um, yeah, we've got loads of supply. That, you know, look, that's a leftover from. No, I don't mean that. I mean, storage is a leftover from my apocalyptic years. Uh, you should always store water, but um, you, I cannot tell you how old that is. Oh. That water has been stored for ages. It's only been in the fridge for years. It's fine. Water it's already thousands of years old. That's right. It is. It is already. <laughs> it's been drunk it is. many times. It, it is. It has been drunk many, many times. Mm. That's one of the things I love about it. I peed it out. Mm -hmm. like, like it's been peed out many, many times too. 
Mm. Gosh, look at that water. That actually looks... I hope that looks amazing on camera with all those <laughs> bubbles and all the air and everything in it. So I'm making lots of discoveries at the moment. Uh, yeah, shall I have the... You want so some going, water too? Going back to, um, to depression and suicide, yeah. I'm... I actually was very close to succumbing to suicide myself. Right, I'm sorry. Um, well, I'm not. The lid needs to come off you. Yeah. I tricked you. <laughs> I got, got a bit confused. You were talking there and I just let the, didn't have the, had the lid on. Go on. Um, so, yeah, when I was in my teens, actually, my, my family member, one of my family members, he passed from suicide and I saw the aftermath of that. He left a few young children behind, um, and I've I had depression for many years, from um, about the age of fifteen till about the age of twenty-five. And I had this really vivid dream. I was lying in my coffin, and I saw my family members standing over me and looking down and just saying, "How selfish of you to leave us." And that. Yeah, that really stayed with me, and I always, I always had this curiosity. I always felt I was here for more. So even when things got very dire, and I, um, yeah, I just, I just really held on to that. That I was, I'm here for more, mm. and I feel like the more is now happening, right. especially with, um, yeah, with meeting Marlon and. It's the self compassion. Like that came through for you even though you were depressed and feeling like you might die. Yeah. And you were speaking about, um, I guess, like, near-death experiences, and I became very ill um, after my fourth child. Really? And I fought very, very hard for a year. Um, yeah, I was very close to having seizures, so I felt like I was walking around with a gun to my head, really? and I battled that very hard for a year. I remember thinking, once I get through this, I'm going to really live life, mm. even though I have these anxieties and these fears. So as I mentioned before, that I'm very much an introvert, and I've got selective mutism, and I've got all these anxieties. I actually really dislike speaking and cameras, and but I still want to do it. I don't know why. I just feel really drawn to to giving it a go. And I, I think the, the fact is, is that that little segment there. I'm so sorry about all this, uh, by the way, all this water running. Yeah, I need to go to the toilet, so it's not very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll wrap up kind of soon, shall we? But I, I, I wonder if we can draw this all together, right? So, because we are, t we have been talking about dreams, the, the ownership of the bus, the fact that we do have challenges and we, we do face life. Have on. had challenges, yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And, <clears throat> and we haven't really got into much depth about, you know, the, the anxieties that comes from... Um, well, from being Marlon, for instance, you know, what happens in Marlon's world when, you know, dreams seem to diminish, you know, as of yet, they don't seem to have done so. They seem to have blossomed, apart from the astronaut one. But um, there's still time. There's still, yeah, there is still time. I might need a robot body first. We'll this, get... this one won't make it to space in one piece. It'll just fall to pieces. Yeah, after all that heavy lifting. Uh, yeah. Often. But I, I wanted to just kind of bring it together. I mean, because this is a, this has really been a conversation of an eclectic. Yes, it's subject. good. It's good. It's meandered to all the different <laughs> like, things yeah. we like to freely speak on. Yeah. It's just and there's not. It's not really like been a structured. No, it doesn't, really. it doesn't need to be, man. We're no. just we're just hanging out and we're having a good time. Mm. Uh, that's what I like. So, I wanted to kind of draw these all together. That you know, I think from somebody who definitely dreams f to somebody who actually feels like there is something more for me to do, and then with the objective to lift people out of that place where they feel that there is nothing for them. I have a very, very good friend whom I, I totally adore. And that's, this individual feels that right now there is nothing that that individual could... I'm being very careful not to mention male or female so I don't draw any attention to that individual. Has absolutely nothing that they could contribute to life that wouldn't 
ordinarily or happily or merrily go along without them. Um, and it doesn't matter what I say to them in terms of the value that they, one, have brought to me, uh, just in being human. And to the others that you can see that, <laughs> That's they, right. that they have to value in their lives. Their children, the impact that they have. And I, 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 I quoted, and, and I, I, I quote this often because I value this. I, I went and saw Jordan Peterson last year. Oh, cool. Uh, with a good friend of mine. And there was a person in the audience, and anybody who's listened to the Butters podcast would have heard me say this, but I will say this again and again, because I want everybody to hear this message. There was a person in the audience who had sent him an email, and the email, and he took questions, and the way he takes questions is he sees what he's been emailed. And the person, and he was selected two questions. So he dealt with number one, and the second question he dealt with was this. I am sitting in your audience this evening. Um, can you say the right words to convince me not to take my life today? Now, what a burden to be given mm. to Jordan Peterson. But this is what he said, and I thought this was really a really cool thing. He shook his finger and he said, suicide is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why he shook his finger is because of the next words. It's not finger wagging wrong. It's wrong because you steal a colour from the tapestry of life. And in that statement, he was saying, You have value. Yes. And life is full of colours. The colour that you represent maybe the very saving grace that I need to make it to the very next day. The fact that you guys are here, you've added color to my life, right? It's color. <clears throat> the purple chair has been given more color and your shirt as well. But, and so what I've just, what I've lived through this evening is somebody who literally has said, well, I didn't take my life because I feel that there was something. Now, you were 15. I'm guessing your early 30s. I'm 35 now. Yeah. 35, right, okay. <clears throat> I'm just guessing on the fact you had four kids and, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And I'm guessing that Marlon is kind of slightly later. Were you 37? 1983. What's that? 30, 30, 37. 30, 37. Yeah. It is 37. There you go. <clears throat> um, so. What I, I sometimes forget exactly what my age is, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I always remember yeah. the year I was born. Yeah, there we go, yeah. <laughs> People go, so, how old are you? I go, 1983, <laughs> and make them work it out. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Oh, God, I, I ought to do that. When I just date 1969, <clears throat> 51 years, but anyway. It was the summer of 69. <laughs> right, okay. Boom. Right, okay. <laughs> Singing this evening, Charles. No, you're interviewing you daft ninny. But so, um, when I see... Uh, so when you come to the point where they say, well, actually, I have dreams yet to be realized. But then the admit, the admittal, the admittance is, well, actually, they're starting now at 35. But I had the realization at 15, more or less. So first of all, that says 20 years sometimes has to go by before we can see things blossom. Right. That's that dealt with, now you, we deal with this other thing. Constantly dreaming, constantly dreaming, constantly dreaming, constantly dreaming, constantly dreaming, constantly dreaming. And then, two dreamers, one who believes that they have a purpose, one believes that they have all the ideas, and they come together, fire and wind. <laughs> wind travels. It blows fires. Yeah, it blows them out or or helps them <laughs> burn them ignite. Or... Yeah, Australia, watch out. <laughs> so, California. But I, I just thought this was an interesting idea that, that what, what I've listened to this evening is this, there's rich colours. And if I could tell anybody out there anything, I could tell anybody anything, because I think this is kind of where the message went. And I feel like this is where my wife would describe this as promptings. She would get promptings and act on these promptings. So I'm going to act on what I believe is a prompting. If you hear this, 
when you hear this, whoever you are, and you feel your life has no value, I want you to wait, please. Could you just wait? Could you wait till the end of this podcast until you can somehow see that Marlon, this meandering uh, a hermit in a way, not not hermit, what do you call it? When somebody, vagabond almost. Oh, you know yeah. I mean? like nomad. A, nomad, that's what I was looking for. The nomad <laughs> then meets somebody who says, well, you know, your nomad lifestyle actually allows me to burst open with purpose. You never know who your nomad's going to be. You never know. You never know who's going to open your box. And yeah, well, the, the dynamics with us, she's helped me to calm down and rest and contemplate and, and uh, in a way be more creative because I'm not being so spontaneous and impulsive and wearing myself out as much. And then um, I feel like my mm, influence on her is the same thing you were talking about, how you encourage your wife yeah. with like uh, just, you know, increasing her ba bravery and supporting her to yeah. do um, these n new and exciting things or... Yeah, you know, but jumping it's definitely around. Definitely my strength. Yeah, yeah. So you know, you're going to do a, a film shoot this weekend. It's like, yes, she's doing another one. You know, like my first speaking role as well. I'm more excited so about do, do you her. Get to, do you get to say, <laughs> "Fuck off, I hate you"? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm dressing up in a costume and going to a party. Dang. Wow. I I like doing. Um, you know, creative things on camera. Um, I've always seen. I've. So I've done heaps of actor work where I'm being somebody else mm. and and I feel like it's just about time where I actually need to go online and just be myself and uh, you know and get known for that and all the different zany cool uh, perspectives that I have on things like we got to share t some of that tonight here so yeah. I'm grateful for that and yeah. like you said this is like planting a seed and a kick up the ass for me just to get a feel for what or this is like this because well, I want to do this more yeah oh yeah, yeah. and, and, and I want to have my own show I'm yeah. famous hey, man, and, and I'm going to come on that show <laughs> yeah. and you're going <laughs> like wow man so yeah. cool you helped yeah. me spark it off bro <laughs> yeah. he gets his beer yeah. I get my bottle of water <laughs> Katie actually has another chair where she's seen <laughs> mm. Now I'm going to end this. Just not. I was liking that dynamic. I was just yeah. trying to bring this up about Katie being not seen. Yeah. Is that, is well, I was going to bring her on. I, I, yeah. Well, but before we do, yeah. On Rogan's podcast, there's always this guy um, called Jamie in the background. Jamie in the background. I don't think you really ever see him unless he happens to, because he controls all the cameras and stuff. Yeah, that's so right. unless he happens to show off for like one of the angles where he's visible mm. or maybe he's just in a box over to the mm. side where he's just never visible and he only talks to them like through a window or something but I don't know. It's interesting to not never ever know what he yeah, looks like. that's right. And, um, well, my mate and, Vlad is like that. Yeah, so what, he, exactly he, right. He sit over there um, He's a great, he's a great cameraman. Oh, I'll tell you what, you'll meet him one day. You'll meet him one day. I just had lunch with him today, actually. Just had lunch with him today. Really cool. Really great. Got great, great mind and everything. And I wanted to, I wanted to, just it's nothing to do with you guys. This is actually, people probably see me on camera doing this. I now, do, you might have actually watched me doing this. My wedding finger, <laughs> my wedding ring used to be on my wedding band finger and you see I have this little flap of skin here and I always used to do this with it but I, and I did I've done I did that for 20 years right I also used to play bass guitar a little bit but now I flipped it over to this finger so now I've got the finger where it never used to be and I now I've now started to do it without the flap of skin that this one has because I've got more flap of skin here and so you probably see me and I, I know it's, it's, it's not a nervous switch. I'm not nervous. I don't have any anxiety right now at all. I'm in a very comfortable setting. But you'll see my fingers doing this. Uh, so I just want to explain that. It has absolutely nothing to do with anything at all. <laughs> but 
Marlon I wonder Mark... what I've been doing with my hands, and I've been doing all sorts of things. Well, I know, but you know, but it's the openness, you know. If we are open, yeah. fall down to the best path. Yeah, that all like... Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, Marlon. Yeah, no, no. don't talk to me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, so, Marlon Mark James, thank you so much for coming along. Katie Wilde, thanks so much for tagging along. I'm going to ask you just to come up here. Come on, come on, come on. Here we go. The beautiful girl in the purple dress. And uh, I do match the. You do match the purple. And why don't you sit somewhere there? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. M move the microphone back that way. Katie, you now sit back a little bit. Oh my God, you got this ma massive tattoo on the back of your. <laughs> Do you, love it? Oh, well, do you want to show the camera? Show the camera. Um, eh? <laughs> I don't know if you can see that. That's no. no, no big deal. <laughs> you can see the size of it, most likely. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, marvelous. Keep the clothes on, dear. Keep the clothes on. <laughs> okay. And then what we'll do is we'll just lean back into Marlon a little bit. Okay. And now bring that microphone around there. I need to move it. There, there. That's it. That's it. And now swing it, swing it, swing it, swing it, swing it. Stop. <laughs> Okay, so that it should pick up Katie now. Katie, I just wanted to say, well, actually, we could have done it like this. But anyway, <laughs> but, uh, uh, it would be really clear. It's not really very comfortable there. Well, I could just stick my foot here and yeah. just keep her on the seat. Yeah. <laughs> so, look, Katie, Marlon, thank you so much for coming on, talking to me. It's been just a wonderful, just a, 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 like a game, You're like throwing the cards everywhere, seeing which one we can come up with. Hey, fishy, fishy, have you got a chip? <laughs> what? I'm, I mean, uh, um, it's just a cat. A relationship? A oh, relationship. That's no, right. no, it was, um, what was the one we came up with? What the... was it? Oh, ownership. Ownership, ownership. that's right. Ownership. ownership. So, beautiful Katie, handsome Marlon, thank you so much. Good to see you. Cool, thanks for having us on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to infect her. <laughs> I was the carrier. Go and wash your hand. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> Thank you so much. Tune in for other Life Lesson 101 uh, podcasts coming up over the next few weeks. They're going to become more regular. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think Katie and Marlon are going to be regular comers back as we talk about their yeah, adventures. At least in six months, like you yeah. mentioned before. And maybe next time I'll go and sit over there. And Katie <laughs> well, I definitely will do it. I definitely want to unscrew Katie's head. On, uh, on the topics of um, <laughs> not just nutrition, but also you've obviously had your own mental health issues, which you've been very brave enough to talk about. So I'm really it's interested very in important those. to talk about. Yeah. Oh, they are really important to talk mm. about. And so I think what we ought to do is that shouldn't wait too long. I think we ought to have a proper mental health mm. uh, no, well, con conversation. Yeah, we'll do it soon. <laughs> um, and Marlon, I, I have... A, I'm going to do this on camera, and I'm going to challenge you. Okay. Do it. So mm. I'm, I'm going to do... So we've got Christmas, we've got January, always funny months. Mm. End of February, I want you to have your first uh, show. Oh, yeah. Cool. By the end of February. You can do it before. Yeah, I know, right? But I'm saying by the end of February. I'm, I'm going to do that online cause so that everybody out there... The people are subscribing and all the future subscribers. Yeah, well, so you know my dream about the never mind the six o'clock news. Yeah. That, that to me suggests, well, you have to do that show every day, you know, and that's, the, I reckon just trying to leap to that rung on the ladder is going to be a little bit difficult. So uh, I reckon if I start doing some kind of um, online broadcasting. Yeah. I should just start with something simple like a weekly thing, or, or yeah, well, yeah, and never then mind work my months. way up yeah. towards the. Hey, look, this, the, this, this, I do this now. At the moment, I'm doing this. What, what I believe is just like once a month, um, but um, it's going to start becoming, you know, every Wednesday evening. There's a new mm. individual here, mm. and um, and then one day I'll move into over there. You see, one of the things about this conversation is that it's actually extremely personal because you're seeing inside of our minds and we're saying, well, this is what we want to do with our futures. Mm. I like that. I like, yeah. I, li I like that because we're being honest about it. You know, and 
Well, that's, I, that was my reason for wanting to come and do this with you is because this kind of setup is what I would like to have and to do with people. Yeah, hold on, I'm just going to bring this other microphone over here. So just in case we don't pick up both of you, I'm just going to stick it there. It, it would just do that there. Boom. But, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and now it's in my face. Oh, crikey, it is in your face, isn't it? <laughs> so. your beautiful face. Mm. Oh. There we go. But, yeah, so I am quite a loud speaker, so hopefully... My sound is travelling around Katie's head. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't unscrewed okay. it yet, so it's still in That's the way. That's right. But the, the, yeah, so where was I at? Uh, I was talking about how this kind of environment is mm. the kind of sort of thing I want to set up. Um, for, for my own broadcasting, I think I want to do the podcasting that like Joe Rogan does, and don't never expect to get nearly as much famous as him. <laughs> but um, you know, having even just a few tens of thousands of people fans, to, you know. But my main thing is, it's got to pay. If I like, I I can't quit my day job. I've got bills to pay. I really want to figure out how to monetize it. I mean that well, that matters to me. I, so the crowdfunded broadcasting, mm. I'll just I, that's what I most want to invest my mm. time mm. into figuring out how to get that kicked off. And, and I then, tell you what, watch the movie A Field of Dreams. A Field of Dreams. Yeah, because the phrase "build it and they shall come" is the best way. Yeah. You know. When I, I remember, it was quite funny. I have a really good, and, and I'm going to tell you, I love this man. And if he ever, if he ever watches Holders, because he's so busy, he's a he. he um, I'm going to guess that that's actually going to work, and not use that mic over there. Um, there you go. We're all discovering things. You didn't drink your tea. Did you I not think, like the taste? No, it's beautiful actually. <laughs> But no, I've been very engaged. Oh. Day, so. I forgot about my tea. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, for goodness sake. Um, uh, his name's Steve Cornish, and I want everybody to remember that name. Steve Cornish is a producer who's um, an engineer and creative genius. Um, whenever I've done anything that I've released, I've almost 100% used him as my... Uh, producer and he's in the UK and he, he was talking about royalties because he was signed to Universal and I was really in, really looking at the royalties and saying well how do I make those money I was I was I, was, I did a bunch of li a bit of library music and he has to wait or at the time he said he had to wait six months to 18 months for the royalties to kick in and he says I don't really worry about the money anymore that this was a few years ago but this is back in 2008 9 10 around there he said because what I do is that I just do the work and the money comes and I think that's the same. For, I mean, I don't. Um, it's a bit like the film acting. Yeah. With, with the film acting, you you wait, and then all you know it takes weeks, and then the money comes into your account. You're like, oh, that's right. Yeah. So I, I mean, I I I do this. There isn't any financial recompense for this, um, but I don't make that my expectation. My expectation is really to confirm or affirm, first of all, other people's lives, but secondly, and possibly more importantly. My, uh, my want, my desire to know more of others, um, because in others I find I, well, I can't actually articulate how much I find others important to me. The uh, that's it. You see, I'm kind of can't actually say how much people are important because. I, for instance, one of the things I really dislike, I, and I know people have got valid reason for saying it, I cannot stand it when people say that humans are a cancer on, on the world or that we're mm, a plague. I think I've heard you say that before. And one of the reasons why I can't stand it is because you wouldn't say that to a six-year-old child who's dying of cancer or whatever, you'd say to that child, life is worth living. You'd say it to the 15 year old you, wouldn't you? And I think the moment you say that we societally are a cancer on the earth, 
is negating the incredible worth of one of the individual and communities around the world. What, and and who, who will have the right to decide who shouldn't have the children? Who's, who's that? That's the thing, isn't it? Who's the, who's the person who has the right to say, you can no longer breed, Marlon? Mm. Who, who will decide that? At which point should we cut our population? Shall we be like China and say only one child? Oh, I think that Earth is actually abundant in resources and the scarcity is just a... It's structured. A, a, it's designed... Well, it's a product of the capitalist society that we well, live I think, in. I think, I think when we say a product of the capitalist society, I think one of the things we're missing is we... Before capitalism, there was feudalism and the spoils always went to the rich. And when capitalism came along, it was the first signs of freedom. People could actually own stuff. People could actually have their own. And that's where the middle class came from. What we then had is the abuses of any system. We've seen it in communism. Communism sounds like a really nice idea to, to proportion with everybody, you know, that which they have worked for or what have you. But there's always abuses of power. We saw it. We saw it in Russia. We saw it in China. We saw it in Venezuela. We saw it in North Korea, <coughs> Cuba, etc. We see all those abuses of power no matter what the system is. And when there is a human system, which is not perfect, because per, per, the problem, problem, humans aren't perfect, those systems can be corrupted. So I think the problem isn't so much capitalism per se, because it's an imperfect system. I think it's the corruption that what we do is that we then say, for instance, and I was just having this conversation with, uh, with, a, with a student of mine who was talking about Bitcoin, and they impose a um, scarcity of cryptocurrency, so it maintains a value. Because we were talking about the International Monetary Fund and how it prints loads of money. Um, the idea of, of uh, operating in gold and silver was because it had a level of scarcity and that money maintained a, a value or, or finance maintained a value. So what we do is that we impose scarcity. And, and I know that the earth is limited resources, but we can be more efficient. And this is where this other form of capitalism is coming in. There's a book written and it's called Conscious Capitalism. Conscious capitalism is when you see the individual making your shirt. You know which farm the cotton comes from and you know mm. that you might have a pension fund or you might have a health plan so that employees are looked after. So I absolutely believe in capitalism, but I believe in conscious capitalism. I believe that what we're doing now is conscious capitalism. Somebody has the choice to pay for this. I know for a fact that I, I'm not gonna take you for a ride. You are part of my product though, and you know full well that you're part of the product. You've been bought on or brought in your own volition, you have a choice. So conscious capitalism, I think, is the new form of capitalism we need to get to. This kind of um, corrupt capitalism would be, is just the same as a corrupt communism. You know, if we have this distribution, somebody comes along and, and corrupts it. And also communism doesn't breed freedom. And it also doesn't breed individuality. I'm very much into the individual. We save individuals. Now, I was going to bring this to a close. I know, but we're getting a lesson. We're getting schooled well, now. No, don't listen. I'm a, I'm a moron when it comes to this stuff, and I'm very much embryonic. I, my main thing is what my mother used to say to me is two things: if you don't have health and you don't have freedom, you've got nothing. Historically, freedom and health have been scarce. Up until a hundred years ago. 60% of the land owned in the world was owned by governments. 60%. A government shouldn't own the lands. 
I don't think anybody should necessarily own the lands. But I mean, we do have to have controls. I understand that. And we have to have regulations. But um, but my mother said this. And so I'm I'm interested in two things. What brings us health? What brings us freedom? And I believe the greater one of those is freedom. If I, I'd much rather be free and so I can look after myself um, than, to, to just, than to have no freedom and be healthy. Because I, we've got plenty of people who have spoken about their lack of freedom. People like um, uh, <laughs> Viktor Frankl, um, Solzhenitsyn, um, these individuals who spent their time in gulags and prisoner of war camps and stuff. You can't have true health without freedom. That's that's mm. right. Mm. That's right. You're more articulate than I ever yeah. will be, my dear. Very good. But that's right. You can't have true health without freedom. And I think if you look at the West, I feel like I'm doing a fucking monologue. I don't mean to. <laughs> um, if you look at the West, <clears throat> people talk about America uh, and Americans talk about America as being the, the freest country in the world. And they look at the problems there and, and all those kind of things. And one of the things I see, and I know this won't be liked, people will criticise it. But I, I'm going to say, one of the reasons why it boasts to be the freest country in the world is because you're possibly free to do the worst things possible, but you're also free to do the best things possible. And I think in the West, we actually have a lot of that. We can do the worst things. We really can. Mm. We're free to do the worst things. Not to say that anybody else isn't free to do to do those worst things, but we, or, or should I say, isn't capable. But I think we live in the freest societies. And these free societies, because they're so free, we both get the best, but we also get the extremes of the worst as well. So yeah, well, if we like segue back to some previous subject matter that we had this evening, which was bringing up. Um, giving a fuck about the suicide rates in this in this country, at least, and um, and the the referendum this year and the people voting for uh, legalising the euthanasia. Mm. So I can see that being relevant to the freedom, mm. the freedom to leave this planet if you wish. Mm. That actually is a real thing. I find it an interesting thing, a, a conversation. Well, for me, the f philosophy about everyone wants to just stay alive and everyone wants to tell everyone that suicide is bad. Uh, and I, I just don't know. I just feel like saying, oh, well, fuck off the planet if you want. See, yeah, you know, like, but that seems really mean. Like, the default on all of us is to say to, to anyone, oh, please don't leave. You know, like, we're all supposed to be here, um, adding to that tapestry of life, right? So, yeah, the euthanasia conversation brings to mind for me that, um, that there's that flip side to the conversation, which is, well, you can go if if you must, you know, if your life really sucks for whatever your reasons are. And a lot of, some people do have really it's suckful suck reasons life, yeah. and, and they would rather expire sooner mm. rather than suffer mm. for many, many more years and have mm. their life extended by machines and crap like that. Mm. So it's, it's understandable to me, like, for... for that people do have a desire to leave. But I like it in relation to what Katie said, which um, which was, the, you know, her consciousness came back to her. It was like, I've got, it. So I've got something to contribute to this world. I've got a reason. Might not know what it is right now, but, you know, I'm going to stick around and, and wait till I figure it out. And that's that's pretty much what, what, what happened that was positive for her because that darkness didn't suck her under. So that's our main message about that, is that I was, I was don't really let that darkness you suck you under. Yeah, I was, I'm interested in what, what you said there. The, the darkness not sucking you under, but also, I'm moving away from my microphone, um, <clears throat> you, 
lo- people have really suckable lives, right? Some people do, right? Mm. I mean, look, I'm not a wealthy man in any means, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but I do okay. <clears throat> It'd be nice if most people just did okay, right? If most people were doing okay, then the idea behind wanting to leave may change. Um, But I also see that people who are doing really well have a high um, one self-harm and two they take their own lives. You know, if you look at mental health, mental, mental health issues, you know, how many comedians have taken their lives? How many rock stars? These are people with money. Yeah. So a suckable life has to be more, sorry, an unsuckable life has to be more than what we have in terms of our temporal facility, if you like. There has to be something else there and something else that goes on within us. Value. And I think something that is um, uh, similar between those that have a lot of money and take their lives and those that have lives where there isn't, they don't have money but they also don't have um, much in the way of hope, is at one end, <clears throat> when you're not working for something or maybe you have all the riches or whatever it is, meaning and value and responsibility are usurped, they're taken from you. And at the other end of the spectrum, there's those who are told that they have no meaning, no value. So you've got people who don't feel like they can contribute but have everything. And those that have nothing and are told that you don't have any value. Now, I'm not entirely sure that that's completely true. I'm sure there are other elements to it. I'm sure there's other values. Look, I've been depressed. I've had anxiety. I've had those moments where I couldn't sleep all night, where I felt like getting up in the morning is the is the least wanted thing <clears throat> from my body. But I'm also really aware that one of the reasons I could get up is because I had living responsibilities for children. I also had students at the time. They were 15. They've now grown to about 32. I used to have 64 students a week. Mm. They are living responsibilities. And that's why, for me, I think, and this is purely a thought, it can be complete shit. And people can criticise it. It's fine. The human, the interaction, the relationship, the the value is in the human. It's not even, to some degree, not even in the environment. Because, look, most people 250, 300 years ago could hardly eat. So they spent every day, their anxiety wasn't, do I feel good about myself? It was, where the fuck is the next meal? Mm. And so they were living for the next meal. It wasn't... It wasn't, uh, nobody was self-cutting because they didn't get enough fucking likes on Facebook. So what we've done is we've changed the value of life. We're not living to live anymore. It's not real connection. It's It's not real connection. When we talk about hunting and and whatever, Mm. I love those things. And there's a tribe who actually, you know, kills their animal and does a blessing over the animal because they acknowledge its sentience. Mm. So we are dehumanizing, desentientizing everything that's of... See, I'm looking at you now with your arm around her and I'm thinking to myself, my God, that's privilege. Mm. To have love in your life is privilege. It is today. It's necessity. Mm, It's the privilege of having a body and being comfortable enough in each other's space to share our bodies with each other. Keep that up there, keep that up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think I think 
we are slowly but surely devaluing that which is most primal in us. Yeah, I, when you were talking about uh, the animal, the people blessing the animal, mm. I was thinking about how um, I, I already naturally have a spiritual relationship with my body, which is like if I die in a forest somewhere, I expect to get eaten by some animals. Right, yeah, yeah. And uh, I sort of feel like the animals would be would bless me. me well, they're definitely grateful for the meat, <laughs> wouldn't they? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That's what I feel. I like the yeah. relationship between a blessing and a gratitude, you yes. know, like, because it's the same thing for me. Yes. Oh, and my that's God. That's lacking in the factory farming, it's the yeah. connection. Yeah, well, the thing mm. uh, that we miss in going to a supermarket is the, is the gratitude. Because there isn't, because we don't have the connection to it. Well, <clears throat> I'm not saying it can't. I'm not saying that people aren't grateful. And we could, and look, there was yeah. a great reminder about frontline workers, wasn't it? But what are what are we grateful for? We're grateful for the factory process, though. We're not being the the kind of grateful we should be for our relationship with the animal, which mm. is you know it's we love shallow. the animal. Mm. It's just a, it's a shallow gratitude. Mm. And what were you going to say about the factory frontline workers? They're the ones in there doing the heart, the well, dirty they're, jobs, they're doing, right? Well, I mean, and then really that's not really a dirty job. I mean, I mean, what's not a dirty job? Well, but, you know, ping. <laughs> that's not really a dirty job. You well, know. I worked on tuna boats once, man. That's a fucking dirty job. Well, that is a hard as fuck job, <laughs> isn't it, right? <laughs> I remember. That's a bit more than ping. Um, ping. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it definitely is. So, I, I, so you know, if I, I don't see things as black and white. No, we shouldn't. And we, and no, we should. You see. That's why one of the reasons why I can't completely condemn capitalism is because it's because it's because it's because it's because it's gained so many people freedom. You know, like Steven Pinker said, mm. where do you want to live? North Korea or South Korea? Mm. Now, South Korea has a problem with poverty. North Korea is fucked. It is poverty. Mm. Where would you rather have been? Communist East Germany? or capitalist West Germany, who was living the freer lives. Which way were people going? They were going east to west. They were trying to get, they risked their lives at the Berlin Wall and they would be shot or captured to get through the fucking wall. So we know for a fact that a form of free markets where people are freedom both to think buy and sell, etc. works for humanity. But what we haven't worked out, and it's a really difficult problem, is how to regulate and still maintain freedoms. Communism requires quite a bit of regulation and control. So we need to find a middle ground, a middle ground. And, and Steven Pinker was brilliant. He said, yeah, let's, like, so for instance here, Capitalism works, it makes people, it helps people to be free, but you also need to regulate something. For instance, the free market doesn't regula regulate air quality or pollution. So a government regulation saying you must look after the environment in which you are in helps capitalism become conscious of the, the, the value of, um, you know, the environment in which you're operating. So I think there will be a process one day. It's slow. And a lot of people think that um, we need to do this stuff today. Yeah, we do, but there's a problem. Humans don't work like that. 250,000 years ago, we were still hunter-gatherers. It took, it took 12,000 years ago, we started to farm. It was only 250 years ago that we actually had free markets beginning. I think the um, evolution of technology is also going to have a huge influence on things. And I, mm. I think that a lot of the things that are important um, to the, the the important tools that we're creating now, we're not really going to use them. We're creating them for our children mm. to use in the future. So we've got all the ideas, we've got all the engineering, we can create the products which are going to improve the planet's health and well-being. We're doing it. 
but we're not maybe not going to see the benefits mm. but it's good that we're creating mm. these things it's that's why i feel like all the the climate change emergency stuff mm. that's in our media at the moment it's really just the driving force behind that consciousness that mm. you're talking about mm. which is you know needs to be enhanced in order to motivate us to accept the changing conditions mm. that we have to create as a society well, yeah, I mean, look at that Swedish guy, Slat. I mean, he's the guy who built the barges that clean up the oceans now. It's mm. like he said in five years, he can do 50% of the ocean cleanup. Five years. All right, well, I want to go and um, pee in the ocean so he can clean it up later. Are you saying we need to bring this to it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Katie needs to go pee in the ocean too, so. Okay, well, we've got two toilets upstairs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I'm going to tell everybody... Gone, um, and it drains tell... to the sea. As long as it drains to the sea, otherwise we'll just drive down there and pee into it. That's right. We've, <laughs> we've, we've, we've got it. You can. I've so, look, I'd just like to thank you both. Once again, we've continued this conversation, <laughs> and of course we could do. <clears throat> um, Katie, I want you to come back specifically. I want you to talk about the mental health stuff totally. Um, and, you know, there's some stories I haven't told there. Mm. Marlon, we've got a three-month goal. Mm. You and I. Woo! <laughs> And uh, look, I'm just really grateful for you both coming along. Grateful for this ch pur purple pear, <laughs> purple chair the experience. Purple chair. I'm, I'm grateful too. And it was cool. Like my main, the main exciting thing I wanted to talk about was the house bus thing. I think yeah. it was a great start for yeah. us to get started off at the beginning of the thing because we're, we're just celebrating that. So um, certainly, like next time we get online and, and have another conversation, I just want to. We just going to give up, give all y'all the update on how the bus life has progressed because we, we're absolute beginners we just decided uh, yeah <laughs> pretty much great <clears throat> and i want to do a whole thing about the house bus right <laughs> i'll tell you what i what i'd love to do um go on tomorrow get it get it get your camera do a horizontal for me oh i've got photos plenty no, already but a film oh yeah yeah and and just walk through the house bus. Oh, you need to see that, okay. Yeah, just walk through the house bus and just kind of thing, do a little bit of commentary, do it for about mm. a minute or so about where it is. And then what I'll do is I'll tag it onto the end here. And um, and then what we'll do is over the coming months, we'll see how you go with your house bus. We'll see how the dreams go, mm. the podcasts, the nutrition, the health and wellness, all of that. I think you've just started a new... Uh, pathway for Life Lesson 101. That pathway I'm is this. Of it. Yeah. yeah, the pathway is this. I'm going to get some individuals, they're going to start in one position, and we're going to see where they go. Yeah, that's right. That's a good idea. Yeah, see where they go. So it's like, and also, those, you know, how you issued me the challenge, mm. you know, find out in those conversations what, what it is you should challenge them with, yeah, that's and then right. challenge everyone. Yeah, that's and then right. next time you come back, I want to see how you've got going along yeah. with that. I mean, it's, it's a cool concept, a cool dynamic to it. Yeah. yeah. And I guess in that is a life lesson. The life lesson is you're, you, you can't do anything if you're dead. Mm. Mm. But you can do as much as or as little as if you're alive. And that is why, uh, that, that, to me, if you can create something in life that benefits you, others, my God, you need to pee. I know I can carry on for ages. <laughs> so now, thank That's you for coming right. on Live Lesson or 101. Or recycle it and drink, drink uh, it again Here's Monday. to you. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Lovely to have everybody <laughs> listen in. This Miranda, Miranda ring? Miranda ring. Miranda ring. Miranda ring. <laughs> Mira Mila what is a fucking word? Reading. reading he's dictionary. reading. He re didn't even read us our Miranda rights. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what it is, I have real problems. Okay. So everybody, look, thank you very so much for coming along. Thank you, Katie, Marlon. Marlon, Mark James and Katie Wilde star in The Big Bus. <laughs> Take care. God bless everybody. See you. <laughs> Wave, Katie, wave. <laughs> the Mexican wave.